I'm just going to perform some checks to make sure that the audio is working on the webcast. Okay. Is that working now? Can we be heard on the can we be heard on the webcast now? Oh we there. So public eye can hear us. Okay. Right. Chair, we're we're back on now. We can be heard on the webcast. And um, the start of the webcast wasn't heard though. So I'm not sure if you want to restart this meeting. Not again. No, that's all right. Uh, Caroline, um, if you can, I could, we could bring in and uh, she can carry on where we left off. Thank you. Yeah, OK. Yeah. I mean, just to recap, um, I was uh, reminding members of um, uh, a communication from the monitoring officer back in February on um, uh, items um, in, in, such as um, have been proposed in, in for Councillor Rice's motion. Um, and it, he reminded us that the role of the planning committee is to uh, determine applications. Um, Follow-ups and questions regarding um, uh, performance. Um, he, they're, they're matters, he, he advised that they are matters and confirmed they are matters that must be decided outside the planning committee. And it's not a question, uh, I know that we've got less items tonight. It's not a matter of how long we've got, whether we've got time to discuss these or not. It's his advice that these matters should not be discussed within this committee meeting. Um, and uh, for, for it's matters... the only way. Caroline, we can get answers to these questions. No, that's not that's not right, Councillor Rice. And with respect, you know, Councillor Rice, sorry, it. Caroline was still speaking. She needs yeah. to be able to express her, her views. Okay. Yeah. We'll take it from there. So, officers, uh, so if, if it's a matter of progress, um, you know, the appropriate form is to contact officers out. We've done that. Oh, but Councillor Rice, you've not what you've not done, or what I'm not aware of, you've done. You've not gone to the chairman of the Planning, Transport, and Overview and Scrutiny Committee. You've not gone to your boss, I would assume, John Ken, and you've not gone to Councillor Gledhill. So what you've done, you've explored the wrong avenues. No, I well, with respect, Chair, I have involved my leader, and I know he's talking to your leader. So the realms are there. Yeah, I appreciate the realms are there, but this is the planning committee. So you, you're coming to the wrong, you're, you're coming down the wrong path. Now, with respect, I'm the chairman of the planning committee. This is the planning committee. I've got an agenda in front of me, and we need to crack on with the agenda now. Unless you can mute and either mute you, then unfortunately we've just got to have to crack on. And I'm only going by what the monitoring officer said, what the legal okay. said, Fair and what member services have said. Thank you. Tell us this, chair. Can we still have this meeting on the 26th and 27th to discuss these items? Which I have, I have asked officers. I have asked you, officers, and in yes. my in my um, in my attempt to arrange that meeting on the 26th yes. and 27th, I was reminded of my position as chairman of the planning committee, and I was informed that that is not the avenue to go down, and the avenue is to speak to the respective group leaders, and or um, and or the uh, the chair of the Planning, Transport and Regeneration Committee. Now, if you, and as I said, I've got to take myself away from this, if you yeah. can find officers who are willing to turn up on that day and discuss these issues, then I'm not against that. All I'm saying is I can't find, I can't find that, I can't do that. So we'll just have well, to take it from there. There's still time. I, I understand where you're coming from, and I do understand. It's just that we are seeing constant emails coming into the whole Planning Committee chair, and there are not satisfactory answers coming from officers. And it's our one opportunity to say to the officers, like Lee, Lee Nicholson, please can you tell us what's happening? If there are difficulties, you know, what are they? I don't think that's unreasonable, Chair. And, and I've approached our leader, and I know our leader's approached your leader. So I know that it's gone above us already. But it is quite, quite concerning that we're having these problems in this committee. Okay, then. All right, well, look, I've taken on board what you said. We need to move on. And if there is a possibility, we'll, we'll see what, what's arranged. But I can't promise anything. And with that, we've got to move on.
Um, okay. Can I just ask who I asked him? Uh, um, when you're saying go to the leaders, I'm not quite sure who to go to. Do I'm I... saying in your instance, Councillor Lawrence, I'd say go and speak to Councillor Gledhill. That would be your first point of call. And, and, and that may be possible. You may be able to arrange that. No, I don't think he is. I think he's Foxall, Regeneration. Well, he's the, he's the leader of the council. So I, I would certainly go to him first. I don't be getting anywhere because he's quite friendly, isn't he? With the, and he spoke against Tilbury Marshes. That's neither here nor there, really. It's, it's outside his room now. He's, he made an announcement. Good, you know, thanks. In the Tilbury Marshes, getting me to go to him for advice. Okay, Caroline, Robin, you've got your hand up, and then we think we need to move on. Um, can I just say that um, uh, I did believe an update of several letters was actually circulated earlier in the week. So I think, you know, members had an update, um, a written update, and, and presumably if, if, if they'd be satisfied with a further written update to specific questions, um, you know, officers would, would uh, you know, be glad. I mean, I, I don't know, speaking for, for, for my colleagues, but, uh, you know, I'm sure there are other ways of, of, of getting some answers to you anyway. And, uh, you know, in, in addition to the updates you've been given, I, I hope that helps. OK, thank you. Um, all right, then. So let's move on. Item four. Declarations of interest. Do we have any declarations of interest? No, okay, no declarations of interest, uh, declarations of receipt of any correspondence. Um, I've had one email from an Anthony Tobin, and that's in relation to Ashley Gardens, and I can uh, confirm that that has been sent to the entire committee, uh, so we won't need to declare that any further. Uh, Councillor Shinnick, I see your hands raised. Uh, Councillor Shinnick, uh, was your hand raised? Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, I've had an email from Hilary Goodman, Ben, good Ben, and Mr and Mrs Mead regarding Ashley Gardens. Mr and Mrs Mead, thank you. Yeah. Uh, the Hilary Goodman one, that, that's not to be discussed this evening. Uh, Councillor Rice? Yes, I, I've had the, uh, the one from, uh, let me just see, Chair, from, yes, the application uh, 21 stroke HAA 28 Ashley Garden Stiffer Clays. And we've also received one from uh, 21 FUL Woodlands Co Farm. And I appreciate what you just said, but we've also received one regarding the Tilbury Marshes. Now, I appreciate we, you know, you've made a ruling that we can't talk about that, but I think at the very least, what should happen now, Chair, is that the officers on those three items should send us a note tomorrow to tell us where we are, because it's most unsatisfactory that applications 14 months later uh, are still not resolved on the 106. And I, I feel that I think we should ask Lee Nicholson to furnish us a further update and let's see where we can go on this because you know our chief executive tells us we're open for business it's quite clear we're not so if we could have a further update chair on these three items which as i've stated to you that's the um, langdon hills golf and country club retirement village the tilbury marshes the tilbury football club chair so if you could arrange that, I'd be uh, would be pleased. Okay, thank you for those uh, comments, uh, Councillor Rice. Uh, Councillor Simmons. Yes, uh, is anybody else having problems hearing? Breaking up on Okay, um, I've not had any problems with hearing. Um, you, you are ever so slightly crackling, uh, Councillor Simmons. Um, uh, Wendy, can you can you see anything there? Maybe could we could we reconnect to Councillor Salmons? Councillor Salmons, do you want, um, is it breaking up here and there? Yes. Okay. Do you want to try leaving the call and rejoining and see if that works any better? Otherwise, okay. it might be an okay. issue.
Councillor Rice, you, you've not muted your mic, so um, thank you. Okay, Councillor Sammons, is this any better now? Yeah, that seems to be better at the moment. Thank you. OK, thank you. All right, then, uh, keep us uh, keep us informed there, uh, Councillor Sammons, on, on how things go. All right, then, there's no further hands being raised. Uh, let's uh, discuss planning appeals, panel pages 31 to 40. Uh, Lee, do, do you have anything uh, you'd like to add? Uh, are there any comments for Lee? Thank you, Chair. Good evening, members. Um, reports for, uh, for noting, but happy to take any questions. Thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, no hands are raised there. OK, so we can now move on to number seven, which is a public address to planning committee. Um, that now allows us to speak to the three items on the agenda this evening. Uh, that start with number eight, which is 20 stroke 01394 stroke OUT, Kemp's Farm, Denise's Lane, found on pages 41 to 78. And this is a, a deferred item um, in relation to this application. It was approved by planning committee members. Officers have taken away our thoughts on this and uh, they've come back with their conclusion. Uh, Matthew, I understand you're taking this one. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, bear with me a second and I'll hopefully get the, uh, the presentation up if the technology allows. Right, hopefully you're seeing what I'm seeing, which is uh, a PowerPoint or a, a PDF of uh, the presentation, which I'll quickly run through. So as the chair's um, just described, uh, this application was presented to you uh, on the 20th of February. Uh, it's a site in the Greenbelt and the proposal is for uh, the construction of uh, 31 self-build or custom-build residential um, properties. It's an outline application with all matters reserved apart from access. The recommendation before you in uh, February was to refuse planning permission uh, for three reasons. First, with Greenbelt. Secondly, related to the um, location of the site and its um, remoteness, so it's a sort of general sustainability objection. And the third reason was harm to heritage um, assets. So. Just to re-familiarise yourself with the case, that's the site. Um, so it's, it's the um, uh, area of land on the outside of the red and inside of the blue line, if you see. So you've got um, the M25 motorway off there to the left-hand side and Dennis's Road or Dennis Road um, to the right-hand side. That's to the east. Um, that's how it looks on... Um, an aerial picture. So this is the, the site uh, top centre. You can make out the M25 and you can make out Dennis's Road, just to put it in some sort of wider context. Um, again, the site is on that top left there. Hopefully you can see where I'm trying to indicate it. Dennis's Road and the built up area of South Ockenden off there to the south, um, southeast. Um, and the scheme which was presented to you, that's just to make the, the point that the site's in the green belt. That's an indicative layout. As I said at the outset, this is an outline application. It's only matters of access which are for detailed consideration at this stage. So that's an indicative layout. Um, please try, treat that as indicative or illustrative only. Similarly, there's an artist's impression of what it could look like. Again, it's indicative. Similarly, there's a range of house types because it's custom build or self build. What would happen would be that the uh, developer would present a serviced plot of land, i.e. a level area of land with connected to whatever relevant services um, to the market. And then if individual house, um, house owners, house builders wanted to come forward and take up a plot, they would basically 
um, build what they wanted to within the constraints of any um, design requirements which would be potentially forming part of a planning commission. So these are indicative. Um, you have to bear with me. My phone's going 10 to the dozen. I'm just going to ignore it. Um, there's some indicative um, layouts. Um, please, again, treat these as um, ways in which the development could occur, but they're not for consideration tonight. Again, some indicative um, CGIs. That's how it could look. It could look completely different. Uh, and some photographs of the site, um, which you probably can recall from last night. Um, it's worth pointing out it is in the green belt. And as you can probably make out from some of these pictures, it's principally open. Uh, there are heritage assets. That's two grade two listed buildings, one virtually within the site. And that building on the skyline to the left there is the other. Uh, listed building which is immediately adjacent to the site. Again, various views showing the open nature of the site um, and a, a brief summary of the issues. Now I'll go back to the Google Earth image because that is relevant to, to the update report which we provided. For information on the agenda, the original report forms Appendix or, or Annex 1. So when it went to committee um, on the 25th of February, um, as I've said, there were three suggested reasons for refusal, but members uh, resolved to approve the application uh, contrary to that, to that officer recommendation. And there were four reasons which members of the committee relied on in reaching that uh, resolution. Those reasons are set out on page 43 of the agenda. Now, briefly, I'll run through the reasons and how we've assessed um, and weighed um, those particular factors. The first factor which members relied on was uh, the five-year housing land supply, so that's the five-year the requirement within the MPPF to have a five-year housing land supply, and where there's been a record of underdelivery, you have to add a 20% buffer. So it's in in essence, it's a six-year housing land supply. Um, that has already been afford been afforded substantial weight. If you look at Annex One and um, our analysis within that um, part of the report, we have given significant positive weight to that as a factor. Um, Appeal decisions um, were, were recently um, consistently uh, referred to that as a factor attracting significant positive weight. But in terms of green belt, it's, um, it would have to combine with other factors such that harm is clearly outweighed. Uh, the second um, argument or the second reason which members re relied on was um, the carbon neutral credentials of the scheme as well as um, the provision of custom built homes. Now, just taking that second element first, the provision of, of custom built homes or self built homes is a component of general housing land supply. And indeed, MPPF paragraph 61 refers to generally the provision of new housing, including custom and self built, as well as affordable housing, as well as housing for the elderly, as well as student housing, as well as family housing as well as affordable housing and other housing. So you really shouldn't be double counting that. The fact that it's self-build is a component of the fact that it's new housing delivery. We've already afforded significant weight to that factor. So in our view, you shouldn't be double counting that. So going back to the first argument under that heading, the carbon neutrality, the applicant has offered a unilateral undertaking. And what that is is a section 106 agreement, which is signed unilaterally, i.e. the applicant would sign it, the council wouldn't. It's still a section 106 legal agreement. It still has to meet the relevant um, legal tests. It still has to be enforceable and reasonable and precise, etc. etc. Now, one of the issues um, we need to, to tease out of that is that um, a section 106 is usually only signed by the land interests um, at that time. Now, obviously, this is um, custom build or self build. So future um, plot developers would have to be a party to, well, they have to sign up to that agreement, if you like. So the way the agreement would have to work, and the devil is always in the detail, um, and I know Councillor Rice has referred to what Section 106 about labour the point, the devil is always in the detail, um, we would have to make sure that the obligations um, were enforceable um, on um, future title um, and future, ti future titles within the development such that the obligation actually fit. Um, 
uh, advise I mean, Caroline may want to jump in at some stage during the debate, but then it, it's possible that would but would work better as a planning condition rather than an obligation. It's worth pointing out that carbon neutral um, it needs definition, and the applicant has provided now a tighter definition of the term carbon neutral. It only applies to the operational phase because clearly the the construction of any building, including residential build, building, including custom build or self build, leaves a carbon footprint. It, it it has an effect on the environment. So we're talking about carbon neutral from the operation or from the occupation of the dwellings, rather than from from the construction phase onwards. Uh, it's worth pointing out, and we've put out in the report, that um, the Council's own policies promote environmental sustainability. So policies PMD 13 and 14 refer to various environmental standards and um, mm. renewable energy on site, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Wrapping all that together, and again, the devil is in the detail of either a planning condition or um, the Section 106 obligation. You can put some weight on that, so that can be added to um significant um weight on housing delivery but again we can't be absolutely sure what sort of weight you could be putting on it because that would have to be teased out in a planning condition or uh, a 106 obligation the third fact fact factor you uh, referred to back in february was that fact um, thorough is a national growth hub um that applies across the borough. That's not site specific. Um, therefore, that argument is easily repeated and could apply in theory to any Greenbelt site in the borough. Consequently, our, our view is you should put no weight on that as a factor. Uh, the final reason you refer to back in February was that you considered the site um, was within an easy walking distance from um, Ockenden Station and shops. And I think you referred to a 12 minute. Uh, walking distance, um, and you could cons you consider also, also consider there could be um, some planning obligation to make the site um, more accessible. So just setting out um, where the site is again on that top left of the screen. There, there is no public footpath along the highway within Dennis's Road. Um, it's only when you get to Aristow Avenue, which I'm trying to highlight there is where there is a footpath which um, actually runs alongside um, the roadway. So the connection between um, the site entrance, which is at that point there onto Dennis's Road, and the station, which is here, or shops, the nearest, the nearest shops are roughly where I'm highlighting there. There is a parade of shops. So it's about potentially making that connection. Now, the applicant has um, revised their section 106 unilateral undertaking um, and they've also provided a couple of options um, with some drawings about how connections um, could be made now there's a little bit of detail here which i'll try um, and run through as, as as easily as i can so what the uh, unilateral um, undertaking currently offers and i have it open in front of me is a financial contribution and the way the um, undertaking is written is that that would be spent towards the cost of upgrading public footpaths 139 and 210 to enhance the link to South Ockenden Railway Station. Now what that means, putting it very simply, and I'll bear with me because I'll need to refer to a piece of, different piece of paper. So there are two public footpaths close to the site, fairly close to the site. So firstly, there's footpath 210. And if you can make out where my cursor is, which is um, on the left-hand side, that is the alignment of footpath 210. So it goes east, sorry, west from Dennis's Road or Dennis's Road up to the M25 and stops. Um, if you wanted my opinion, it's probably um, a remnant of an older footpath. And when the M25 was built in the 1980s, it, it probably severed the footpath. And that's as far as it goes. So in terms of getting to shops and getting to um, South Auckland and Railway Station, station that really doesn't do anything. The other footpath, which is referred to by the draft wording in the unilateral undertaking, is footpath 139. Now, again, if you can follow my, my cursor, that runs from the eastern side of Dennis's Road across that farmer's field and it pops out about where I'm in indicating there. 
So put it simply, it goes across a ploughed field and it go, it emerges onto West Road. And on that section of West Road, again, there is no public footpath. So again, limited benefit, in fact, negligible benefit. There is a separate point here in that the UU, and I'll go on to the other um, paperwork which the um, applicant has offered shortly, but the UU says um, the, the developer will give the council money to upgrade those footpaths. There is a legal issue here, and again, Caroline may want to chip in. Um, we don't think we're actually entitled to spend money upgrading footpaths because they're on private land. It's a public right of way across private land. So that, that's the way the UU is wording is of negligible or zero benefit. The other part of the story which the applicant um, has been um, liaising with us about is potentially, and I think this is probably more to the point which members were um, getting at last committee, is potentially a new section of footpath, i.e. pavement, if you want to put it in those sorts of terms, between the site entrance, which is there, and a point here, which is about, in terms of distance, and I measured it a bit earlier, if you bear with me. Yeah, it's about 125 metres in length. As I said, there is no footpath there. That part of the highway is unlit and it is subject to a 60 mile an hour limit. It's unrestricted. Um, so what the applicant has done is provided two potential options for the provision of a, um, a footpath or pavement, if you want to put it in those sorts of terms, either on the eastern or on the western side of um, Dennis's Road and what that would do, ignoring the footpaths, because as I said, the footpaths don't really um, provide um, a link off road, um, so to speak, or a safe link to the station or the shop. So what would happen then potentially is if there's 125 metres of new pavement on either side of Dennis's Road, it could link to this area here. Hopefully you're making out where I'm, my, where I'm putting the cursor. So to the that general area is the former Bellis landfill site. It's been restored. Um, <clears throat> that restoration is due to finish, and I apologise for the detail here, but it is quite important. Um, that restoration is due to finish at the end of next year, and when the site is fully restored, there'll be full public access. So there'll be footpaths, there'll be cycleways, and there's um, habitat enhancement, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now you'll be able to make out on that area of the picture some of the footpaths have gone in already. It's a phased development. So what potentially could happen is if a new section of pavement or footpath was put in between the site entrance and that point there, pedestrians in theory would be able to walk, and I hopefully you can make out my cursor, along this alignment here, which is off-road, so it's you know safe, inverted commas, down here, down here, across there, and you pop out onto our Arisdale Avenue, Arisdale Avenue, there is a public footpath, you know, a pavement, and from there, obviously, you can get to the station and get to the shops. So that is the only really way you could do it safely. So um, the question uh, we've been looking at as officers is whether or not that connection between um, the, the country park, let's put it that way, and the site entrance is feasible, is it safe, et cetera, et cetera. Now, there's a bit of detail set out in the report, but basically there are queries um, as to whether that could be achieved, um, and the high resource officer may want to comment in some more detail. It would need a road safety audit. There are questions about the geometry of the road. It's a little bit bendy there. As I've said, it's subject to a 60 mile an hour limit. You probably couldn't do 60 miles an hour there, but I'm sure people often try. Um, there are hedgerows on both sides of that particular road, and in order to accommodate any um, footpath, they would probably have to go. So there's an impact on the rural character of the area, because hedgerows are, are usual, usually a, a component part of that. Dennis's Road is unlit. Um, there are also ditches on both sides. So again, um, could a reasonable width um, footpath be achieved without, you know, people you know potentially coming into um, contact with with changes of levels there's also a telegraph pole on the western side which potentially would require 
uh, relocation. There's also a question about the width of the footpath because at certain points it would be less than the, the two metre standard. In terms of the walking distances, because members were quite specific last time about the walking distances, I have measured them. So if that route through the country park from the site entrance is about 1.3 kilometres to the station, roughly speaking, that's about 17, more meter, uh, 17 minute walking distance for the average person. And to the nearest shops, you're talking about a kilometre and a half, which is the thick end of a mile. So that's probably nearer the 20 metre walking distance. Putting all that together, and I'm sorry that's taken so long, but that just goes to prove there are some question marks and some queries about whether or not a um, link, a reasonable walking link between the site entrance and the railway station and the shops is achievable. The other thing just to say is that if the if people would walk through that country park that's fine it's on a, it's on a it's off road and it's on a reasonable surface it's also unlit um and there would be in my opinion no opportunities to light that because of the ecological interest now on that site it would be wholly irresponsible to introduce street lighting upon along the country park so you'd have to consider at certain times of the year whether or not that would be um a route which would be attractive for people to walk so there are question marks over that. Therefore, in terms of uh, the weight you should put on that, we consider it's limited because the case simply hasn't been demonstrated yet that a reasonable walking link could be achieved. <coughs> Very quickly going to the other um, the other reasons for refusal. So going, going back, because we're not convinced that a reasonable walking link could be achieved yet because of the factors I've highlighted, we consider the second reason for refusal probably hasn't been sufficiently addressed yet. So it probably as, as things stand, it's probably still there as a reasonable reason to refuse the application. The final reason was about heritage assets. Now I've referred to the two listed buildings which are close to the site. Uh, members at the last committee or the February committee did refer to the fact um, that they considered the site to be secluded. Now I've mentioned two public footpaths. Um, and footpath number 210, which is this one here, um, although I haven't walked it recently, um, you could reasonably take the view that from that public vantage point, you could get a view towards the heritage assets and you would see those heritage assets in the context of the new development. The council has a statutory, statutory duty to consider uh, the effect of new development on the setting of listed buildings the applicant hasn't provided any further information about whether or not those uh, settings would be um, impacted from public footpaths. It's also fair to say there's a, a public footpath on the east, sorry, the western side of the M25. Um, I had a quick look on Street View a bit earlier. That's perhaps more limited, but there is a public right of way to the south. Conceivably, users of that footpath would see the listed buildings in the context of the new development. Therefore, that still remains as a consideration. Um, we're not satisfied that that reason for refusal has been um, overcome by anything um, submitted by the applicant. Indeed, the applicant hasn't submitted anything further on that particular point. So wrapping all that together, I'm conscious of the time, I'm wittering on a bit. The, the original uh, recommendation for uh, refusal still stands. I'm happy to take questions, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, I think Councillor Lawrence was uh, first uh, with a question. Councillor Lawrence. Thank you, Chair. Um, could you tell me, um, has a road assessment been done yet and uh, how's it come back? Chair, from, from my um, uh, conversations with the case officer, the uh, the applicant's agent was advised by email that um, we'd need something called a road safety audit and, and, and the highways officer would be able to answer the detail of that. To my knowledge, we haven't received a road safety audit um, back from the applicant. Um, wouldn't that alter it, though, if it come back positive? You've already, you're coming back tonight saying everything's in a negative way with the roads and things, but... Shouldn't that be done first before you come back after, you know, you've already seems like you've made your decision? Chair, as, as, as I've just said, we, we have asked the applicant's agent to provide a road safety audit. None has been provided yet. Right, OK. Uh, the other thing is, um, 
with phase one, was that a concern then about pathways? Uh, Chair, I mean, I haven't got that information before me. I mean, some some other um, planning officers may have a recollection of that one, but um, we see, are assess we are we're assessing this application I know, uh, for the development in front of you at this time. It's the same area. It's right next door. That got approved, but this one, you're saying that you're really concerned about there's no paths, but obviously, you've already approved the first phase one with no paths. So I'm just yeah. wondering why it's such a big thing this time. Yeah, Chair, I, I stand to be corrected by some of my planning colleagues, but I believe the the previous applications were actually recommended for refusal and um, were um, approved by committee contrary to recommendation, but we'd have to check the various minutes, etc. Yeah, I appreciate that. And um, I also, I think personally, considering how well you have done, like where I live quite nearby, we've got Stamford Meadows, now, considering all the hard work that's been done there, I'm, I'm sure it's, uh, I'm sure Thurrock Council would be able to negotiate something and make pathways and make the roads so, open. Considering all what's been done for Stamford Meadows, because that just seems though, you know, we've jumped through hoops for that one, and this one it's sort of been obstacles in the way. Could we not sort of work through this and make it better for all round? Chair, I think I've, I've detailed in quite some uh, quite some length um, the issue, and the issue is put simply: um, to walk for for a pedestrian link to the station, or indeed to any amenities, you know, to 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 the nearest shop for a, you know, the pint of milk test, which is often referred to. Um, from the site entrance onto Dennis's Road, there is no footpath. It's a, an unlit road subject to a, six, a maximum 60 mile an hour limit. It's about the feasibility of getting, uh, of walking um, to a point where you can get off road. So I've mentioned the two public footpaths and I said it, it, it's slightly confusing in that the applicants offered a unilateral undertaking and that refers to a financial contribution towards public footpaths. The reasons I've given, that's of negligible or indeed no benefit because one of the footpaths, footpaths doesn't go anywhere. The other footpath is across a farmer's field and it pops out onto a section of road with no footpath. So there's probably negligible benefit. And again, there's a legal point. Can the council spend money upgrading footpaths on private land? I think the answer would probably come back no. So the issue is, can there be a section of footpath around about 125 metres in length, which could connect to Bellis Country Park, which is partly open, and you'll make out quite clearly on the aerial image in front of you, you can make out the footpaths. So it's about making that connection. Is it possible to make a connection from the site entrance, 125 metres, to Bellis Country Park? And I suppose the supplementary question, if that connection can be made, and there is a question mark, and the highways officer might want to go into the detail about the highways officer has been on site. So, you know, he, he, may, he may well be able to fill in the precise detail, and I'm not qualified as a highways officer. But the more general question is, if that connection can be made, and uh, you can get to the country park, how reasonable would it be for somebody to then walk through the country park, which is unlit, um, to get to the railway station? How attractive would that be at certain times of the year? or an inclement weather, for example. So would that tick the box in terms of making the site accessible such that the reason for refusal would be outweighed? In our view, uh, there are too many question marks, put it simply. But if you're asking really detailed highways points, you know, about the, you know, the width of the footpath and, and hedgerows and road safety, I'm, I'm gonna defer to the highways officer on, on those matters. OK, yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks for that, Matthew. So, yeah, I mean, it, it all depends on, on what your opinion is. I mean, I, I did support this application originally. Truth be told, I think a pathway from the site to that park is helpful. I think it gives choice in the summer. But being realistic, if you're going to move on to that site, um, you know, it's going to be uh, you're going to have in mind that you're going to have a car. It's not uncommon to have these sites in Thurrock. 
Um, so whilst I think there's a lot of emphasis on sort of uh, walking access, I think actually, in, you know, in reality, I think we should be honest with ourselves. If you're going to buy a house there, uh, you're going to need a car. Um, so we've got a few hands raised. Uh, I'll go to Julian because I think he's had his hand up first and then I'll go to the councillors. Uh, Julian, did you have anything to add there? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I would point out on your point that, that a, a reason for refusal is, is the MPPF and uh, for, from a highways point of view, in terms of accessibility, in terms of cycling and foot and walking. And that's an important point to, to, to take into account with any, any development. And this development doesn't have good walking and cycling. The idea nowadays is to try and encourage people to use alternative means of transport rather than their vehicle. In terms of Councillor Lawrence's point, I've actually walked the route. I ha it was so difficult to walk, and I must admit, when I actually drove there, somebody actually overtook me along that stretch of road because I wasn't actually going fast enough for them. So they were going well over 60 mile an hour because I was doing about 40 at the time. And I've walked along that verge, both sides of the verge. On the on the west side of the verge, the, the verge is very narrow once you get towards the country park. There is a hedgerow and there is a telegraph pole that would need relocating and the hedgerow would have to be removed. Now that hedgerow is not as far as I'm aware on the highway, so it wouldn't be it wouldn't necessarily be for us to be able to remove the high the, the hedgerow. The, the the telegraph pole would likely be relocated would have to be relocated into the farmer's field and I'm not sure sure that the farmer's field farmer would want it in his farmer's field. It is it is a double tele well it's a sort of double telegraph pole because it's got a, an angular bracket to hold hold it up. So it actually takes up quite a lot of space. The other option they put forward was on the east side, but you to get onto the east side you've obviously got to cross the 60 mile an hour road uh, on the bend and the bit by the where you come out of the development is on a bend. When you get up towards where the country park is, uh, that is also near a bend and the forward visibility of vehicles is not good. And at the moment, because of the hedgerows, the visibility for pedestrians towards the vehicles is not good either. As Matthews also pointed out, along both sides of those, along both sides are highway, are, there are ditches. So it's not a simple case of just being able to put some tarmac down on the verge. Uh, and in, in, in those instances, there are also other utility cables along the west, along the east side that might well cause problems. So that it's not a simple case of just laying some, some tarmac in, in, in either of the, the, the options that they put forward. I've spoken to the public rights of way people and in terms of what Matthew is talking about, he's absolutely correct. We are not in a position to make public footpaths better. Uh, if if that, we can't we can't spend money putting, uh, uh, say, gravel or something across a ploughed field because that's not within our remit. They have indicated the only way that you could potentially resolve this situation if you wanted to use the public footpaths was to actually have them diverted, which obviously would cause a significant amount of money and would also need the, the permission of the, the, the landowner. And as Matthew pointed out, footpath 139 actually goes to back onto the country lane itself. So it's not uh, it's it's not an appropriate route to take. And and the most significant point to add, I think, is that this route is not lit and it, it and in if, if, if an evening I, I can uh, having walked it is not some somewhere that I would have particularly liked to have walked. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for those comments there, Julian. Okay, so we had a few hands raised. Um, I think uh, was Councillor Shinnick first. Councillor Shinnick. Yeah, um, I'd just like to add that uh, um, I think putting a footpath along that route is very dangerous because I drive around there quite often and when I drive along there, I hold my breath, especially when I go around the bend. And to have a footpath near the park, going up to the park, is so dangerous and who would want to walk through there of a night when you get off of a train? You know, it's a no-brainer to me. Thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, Councillor Potter. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I don't want to sort of oversimplify this, but um, really, if someone is looking to buy a property uh, in this development, once it's developed, 
and there were problems with accessibility, they would not buy the property. Um, it would be their decision to buy the property or not. So I, I can't see that being a problem in, it, in any way. Thank you. Okay, Chair, thank you. Chair, uh, can I just, sorry, Chair, can I just come back on one point Councillor Potter's made there? I mean, the, the, a, a future purchaser wouldn't be buying a property, they'd be buying a plot. The application is a self-build. They'd be uh, a future purchaser would would be buy, be buying a, a vacant but serviced plot on which they can build their own house. Okay. Yeah. No. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, um, clarification, there, Matt. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. Spotter. I'm I'm aware of that. I'm aware that the but then if accessibility is a bad problem, they wouldn't buy the plot. I mean, it it just makes sense that if they didn't like the development or didn't like the potential to develop their um, modular home or whatever, they wouldn't proceed with that. Now, I've lived in South Ockenden nearly all my life, and I often walk around there, and it is a very pleasant walk indeed. So I wouldn't have a problem with that. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Rice and Councillor Lawrence. Uh, yes, Chair. Um, well, what we've got here really is uh, a debate between officers and members and quite simply a section 106 regarding the Bellis Country Park to have a link to the shops and the railway station would suffice. I think the officers are making very heavy weather of this chair. Um, so I would be mindful to say that, you know, that the Bellis Country Park there could be a footpath there. There could be some lighting. Obviously, the applicant would have to pay, but that would be subject to a 106 and obviously a, a, a unilateral undertaking, which the applicants already said they're quite prepared to do. So uh, I think we are making very heavy weather of this, Chair. OK, sure. thank you, uh, Councillor Rice. So just yeah, to okay. confirm, we're in questions at the moment. Um, then what we'll do, once we finish questions, we'll go straight into debate and then we'll head to the vote. I think we've, we've you know, spent uh, enough time on this to be able to come to a, a formal decision. Uh, who was coming in there? Was that you, Matt? Yeah, just two, just coming back on Councillor Rice's um, points there. So two things. I mean, there is access through the former, former Bellis um, Landfill Country Park now. You can make out those footpaths on the image in front of you. So those footpaths are there and they were secured through the planning conditions and obligations on the restoration scheme, which was approved by the former Development Corporation in about 2011 or 2012. So those, those, those connections are there, as I've explained. The difficulty is getting from the site entrance to the country park, because there's a section around about 125 metres where there's no safe um, off-road link. There's no footpath, there's no pavement. That's the issue. Once you get to the country park, you can walk through the country park, it's off-road, and you can get back onto Aristow Avenue, and from there you can get to West Road, and you can get to the station, you can get, get to the shops. So it's about that section between the site entrance and the country park. The issue of lighting, um, the country park will be operated um, by probably Essex Wildlife Trust. I don't think it's been confirmed yet because I haven't seen the detail, but it went, once the restoration is complete and it's scheduled to be complete by the end of next year, the management of the site will be handed over to an environmental charity. And that's either going to be Essex Wildlife Trust or RSP. If I was a betting man, I'd probably say Essex Wildlife Trust. Because of the ecological enhancements which have gone in there, um, you know, you can make out on, on the on the aerial there's been um, water courses put in, wildflower meadows, probably um, hibernacular for reptiles, et cetera, et cetera. Introducing lighting in that setting would be wholly inappropriate. And in point of fact, um, Essex Wildlife Trust would probably object, as would a number of... Um, consultees, you know, or, or, or interested parties um, regarding, um, you know, who have an interest in nature conservation, because that would be at odds with the nature conservation interests, which has been um, generated and um, will continue to, to you know, um, be attracted to that site. So it won't be lit. 
is a recreational footpath which would be attractive mainly in spring and summer um, and during daylight hours. So to put in lighting, wholly inappropriate. Okay, thank you. Right, so we've got two, I think Councillor Rice and Councillor Lawrence are still to speak and then we, need, we really need to move on. Yeah, yeah Councillor uh, Rice, did you have a supplementary? Yeah, yeah, just coming back on that, I mean, with due respect to um, the officer, I, I appreciate what he's saying, but until we get to talk to the Essex, you know, Wild Park Trust people, uh, we wouldn't know um, about whether they would like lighting or not. So I think we could put that down to a section 106, um, which can be actually sorted out. But it's quite clear there is accessibility. It's just a matter of a 125 centimetres, did he say, or whatever, 125 metres. It's not a vast distance. That's what I'm saying, Chair. So I think... We shouldn't make a mountain out of a molehill, and these items can be sectioned off um, on the 106 and can be obviously dealt with by the applicant and by these trusts and our planning officers, which I have every confidence in our planning officers, they will be able to do this. Okay, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councillor. Uh, yes, go, go ahead. Yeah, you. sorry, I, I don't want to lay the point, but I've got, I've got to come back. So, I mean, on, on the, the point about the potential for lighting, there is an approved restoration um, and aftercare scheme for uh, the landfill site, um, the former landfill site, which would have been approved, as I said, 2011 times, something like that. That doesn't include lighting. Um, and as I said, it, in my opinion, not only on the nature conservation grounds, but that site is within the green belt and introducing street lighting columns, no matter how sensitively designed, would be inappropriate. And in point of fact, you could argue would it be inappropriate development in the green belt. The other point is you cannot rely on a new 106 through this development to secure lighting, lighting even if lighting were to be found acceptable, which I very much doubt, because um, the current um, applicant has no interest, no landed interest in Bellas Country Park. So you cannot rely on a, one, a new 106 to solve the issue. Um, and just for clarity, it's 125 metres. OK, thank you. Uh, Councillor Lawrence. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd just like to put Matthew's mind at rest to say that in the park in Ockenden, We've just put all lights in last year. They're sensor lights, LED lights, and they only come on when anyone walks near them. And they're very beautiful and they enhance the area and give safety. So there's lots of options out there what can be used. Uh, I know Councillor Shinnock and, uh, and Mike, we, we all attended it and we all checked them out and we know this is possible. It doesn't cost anything and it's a very good way to go. And the other thing is, is that all these problems that are being put up, I'm sure they can all be resolved if we want to, because phase one was passed. They've gotten along all these years with the road as it is now. So anything what we're adding to, we can make it even better. And we can work and we can go ahead with this. So it all depends as it is in your view. OK, thank you. Right. Um, was there any other hands up there? Uh... Steve Taylor. Thank, thanks, Chair. Uh, I'm assuming we're now in debate. Is yes, go ahead. Yes, that's correct. So, fine. Um, so there's a few things. If, when you look at that map, if you look to the opposite side of the road to where the site is, there's a house out in a field. And when I was younger, I lived there. So I know that area particularly well. Walking along that road, even as a teenager, was incredibly dangerous. And in fact, because of the distance, we always walked across the field. It was just easier and simpler. Um, so, so that's the first point I'd make. And I agree with Councillor Shinnick, you've got to be crazy to want to walk along that road. So that, that's, that would be my first point. Second one is that this is a planning application to be built on a site. And actually we've spent the last, or I've you know, collectively spent the last half an hour or so talking about sensible or reasonable access to it. 
And I don't disagree that if you try hard enough, you'll always find to do ways of achieving things. But what's interesting is it appears to me this is like somebody saying, oh, I want you to cut your trees down. And you go, yeah, but they're my trees in my garden. And you can have planning permission to do it, but without my permission, you can't. So you've got the people that own the, the, the either side of the road, which is farmer's fields. So that's an issue. And I, of course it is. But why would they want to necessarily facilitate that? Um, and when you then talk about a country park, um, you're now kind of you're out in the middle of arguably nowhere once you get past the end of Arisdale Avenue. So so putting lighting up there, much as it might make people safer, is a, a, absolutely, as been as been said, is completely counterproductive with a country park. It, it, they're just the two things don't hang together. But, but people seem to want to be pushing forward a, a, an issue here about access to the site, fixing the problem of access to the site and actually isn't that down to the developer to um to come up with the um the solution to their problem and yet i what i'm hearing is an awful lot of people trying really hard to justify what a developer wants to do and i'm just not sure that makes sense at the end of the day if if you allow this to go on then the other sites, and there's been many of them where access has been an issue. Um, this one is kind of laughable because of the distance that you have to provide access to it. So some of the ones that have been difficult in the past have been, shall we say, less complicated. And this one, just by its definition, is a complicated site to deal with the access to. And it's out of the control of the developer and it's out of the control of the local authority. Um, or at least a large section of it is. So, so I'm, I kind of, I'm, I'm not sure if people are just batting down an avenue almost because they believe, or maybe they do believe it's the right thing to do. But the, the reality is, it, it, it's not within the gift of the council to do some of these things. Anyway, that's my point. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Steve. Yeah, your interesting points, what you're saying. I mean, there's a lot of energy and focus on, on access to the site. Um, obviously, it's well within the, the MPPF, so I can understand whilst there's, there's a huge focus on that. I think ultimately th there is a view that, that sites like this are quite remote and that these sort of these remote sites are actually quite safe due to their remoteness. And ultimately, um, you know, if I look at my parents who, who are at retirement age, for me, I, I think I'd rather them be in a site like this than in a site near the town centre because their, their isolation uh, effectively gives them that element of safety and ultimately choice. You know, it'll be people's choice whether they live here or not. So I get 100% get what you're saying, um, but ultimately, you know, remoteness is not is not the end of the world. We we approved Langdon Hills, we approved that hospice site. I appreciate they appreciate there were special circumstances, but again, they're they're all on country roads, very very well isolated. So your yeah, interesting points, um, Councillor Lawrence, and then uh, Councillor Rice, and then I think we need to move on to some form of conclusion. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Yes, I agree with what you were saying, uh, Tom, about a lot of people do feel more safe. Not everybody wants to live in uh, areas that are built up. And the thing is as well is that the phase one went through, everything's been fine, we've had no problems. And I'm just wondering if anyone has ever spoke to the people that live there to say that they've made complaints about the road or anything. I don't think they have. The people that live there, like Councillor Potter said, knew the conditions when they decided to move there and this is the same thing what's going to happen now and uh, as for Steve Taylor I, I know he's got a lot of experience but I am just feel we're very lucky to have him because nearly on every application we've had he knows someone who's lived there or he's got family that lives there so he's got lots of information about the area but the only reason we're for this is because it's self-built and this is what the government wants us to push for and this is why we should support them. This is a beautiful site, be ideal for self-builds. All right, the road might be a little bit dangerous near it, but so it is in Stamford. And look what Thorough Council has done for that. They've jumped through flaming hoops to get that done as you come off the roundabout. So if, if you want to have it done, we can do it and we should work together and do it. OK, thank you. And that brings us to Councillor Rice. 
Yes, I think um, Councillor Lawrence is quite correct. Um, we did jump through hoops to uh, adopt the Bellway system, um, which is on the Fobbing High Road. So, um, you know, we can get this done. And let's be clear, Chair, we are a failing authority because we haven't got a five-year supply. We lack a 20% buffer of housing supply. So that's number one, where we start from. So that's a substantial weight, as the officers have already indicated. And to denigrate the idea that the scheme is carbon neutral and provides custom self-built homes, with the greatest respect, we have signed up as a council to, we declared a climate emergency on the 23rd of October, 2019. So we're committed to going down the carbon net zero by 2030. So that's a council policy. So we can put that in um, and, and make it a substantial reason. Um, whether the officers like it or not, we cannot escape it. Thurrock is a national growth hub. And that's another substantial reason. And, and then when we go finally on, the development would be a 12 minute walk to the train station and local shops once the proposed footpath was in place through the country park and it would be sustainable. Now, we've, we've heard from Councillor Lawrence that um, in the Bellas Country Park, they do have lighting there. Um, it's very subtle, um, you know, and it, it's not on all the time, but it's on when people go through that section. So we can do these things, and it's up to the council officers and the applicant, um, and it's a unilateral agreement, undertaking agreement, that the applicant signed up. So I can't see any reason, Chair, why we should not give this the green light this evening. I think we need these type of homes, they will give confidence to local people that they can at last build a house within their budget chair. Um, to pay 150000 for a plot of land um, would be quite reasonable. And then to build your own home and to customise it into a nice self-build home would be absolutely fantastic. And I believe these items of the footpath can be overcome. And, and just one other thing, Chair, we talk about the heart heritage assets. They're four to 500 yards away. The M25 borders on them. You know, again, the officers make very heavy weather of this. The M25 is a national motorway, which is going 24 hours a day. If that doesn't um, harm to those assets, uh, you know, this minor housing scheme will, I believe, only enhance the area. And I think we should tick the boxes on this occasion, Chair, and move on, get, take it to the vote, push it through, and let's get cracking on some of our, our council policies. In particular, Chair, the climate emergency which we all signed up to on the 23rd of October 2019, which commits Thorough Council to becoming carbon net zero by 2030. So we've got the items there. We need to have the officers to push this through and the Section 106 will allow this to happen. And the applicants have, have uh, developed their arguments I see nothing wrong with it. I believe that we're batting in the right direction and we're going to have something that will be very proud, you know, to leave behind where we've got self-built homes, custom self-built homes, which will be carbon neutral. That's amazing because we know most of our housing stock is leaky. And that's why the government are taking action on gas central heating, Chair. But I'll leave it there, Chair. I think I've said enough, and I think that's the way forward for us. Thank you very much.
Okay, thank you, Councillor Rice. All right then, so, um, Matthew, you've got your hand raised. Um, I think we're going to head to the vote, uh, Councillor Sammons. What, what we need to do, I think, first is potentially go to this vote. Uh, Matthew, did you have anything to say there? Yeah, it was just a couple of factual points, which I, I think it's only fair to come back on. So, so Councillor Rice referred to the fact that he considered the heritage assets were four to 500 yards away. One of them is actually within the site and one of them is probably about 20 or 30 metres away. Um, I don't want to labour the point because I know, I think we can guess what way some members are going to go with this one. I don't want to labour the point about lighting through the country park, but the 106, which could be um, attached or, or could be a requirement of any planning commission for this site, cannot require lighting on a site on a separate site. It's as simple as that. I mean, Caroline, Caroline, the legal advisor, might be out of um, well, detail um, on that point, but it's beyond it's beyond the control of the applicant. It's as simple yeah. as that. Well, interestingly, I think ultimately it, it does come back to that element of choice. Sometimes I understand why lighting is important, but the the, the park itself is quite isolated. So even with lighting, it's it's probably not something that should be encouraged. Uh, certainly in the winter months. So it's sort of a double edged sword. That one. I can see how it's a benefit. But also it's incredibly isolated so again it, it comes down to the element of choice and, and how you're actually going to be accessing this site um right now what i want to do I'll, i can go to let's have a look here i can go to councillor sammons and i'm going to head to the vote and then i'll bring you in councillor rice it will depend on how that vote goes uh councillor sammons yes i've actually driven past that first part of that site and it looks absolutely lovely I, I can't see an issue with it because if anybody's going to buy somewhere that's slightly remote, they actually like that sort of living. So are they going to want to walk? They'd probably just try it. I mean, I, I personally think we should support in this development as it's carbon neutral. So okay, then. That, okay, no, thank you. Opinion. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, then. So um, I think we've uh, asked enough questions and debated this one to head to vote. Um, there is a recommendation set out on page uh, 75. Um, let's just double check that. Uh, yeah, but page 75, and that's uh, recommendation 8.0. This is obviously the uh, officer recommendation. Uh, to refuse planning committee, uh, or, sorry, refuse the planning application um, with the three reasons set out. Um, is that uh, who would like to um, recommend that officer recommendation or refusal? Okay, uh, I can't see any hands raised. Uh, Councillor Shinnick, okay, yep, um, that would be in line with how you voted last time. Is that seconded? Is, is it, is it, would anyone like to second Councillor Shinnick's? Um, Recommendation, Councillor Fletcher. Okay, so that's been uh, proposed and seconded by Councillor Fletcher. All right then, so we'll head to the vote. Um, what I'll do, I'll do a show of hands. Uh, all those in favour of rejection, please uh, show your hands digitally, including uh, Councillor Fletcher and Councillor Shinnick, please. Okay, that's two votes in favour of refusal and uh, all those uh, against refusal, please show your hands. Okay, and that's, uh, that's six against refusal. All right then, so that's, uh, I'm sure Wendy's happy with that. The uh, recommendation for refusal has been lost. Um, I will now bring, if you could uh, lower your hands. Uh, obviously, Lee, I'll bring you in here. You're looking for uh, an alternative recommendation, which would be have to be seconded and then uh, reasons set out. Is that correct? Uh, thank you, Chair. So just refer members uh, to the Council's Constitution. Um, so Chapter 5, Part 3, uh, 7.4 um, says, if the committee is still of the same view, then it will again consider its reasons for granting or refusing permission um, which in this case is granting permission, and a summary of the planning reasons for that decision will be given, which reasons must then be formally recorded in the minutes of the meeting. The Constitution goes on to say that it is important that justification for departing from recommendation 
um, is, is that which is recorded in the minutes and those reasons given at the committee meeting and in public are uh, not subject to later elaboration in the minutes, which is more extensive than, than, than the presentation. Um, the Constitution continues to say in instances where, um, uh, so, sorry, uh, it, it carries on to, to say essentially um, members should exercise caution in not giving undue weight to any particular consideration. Um, and the reasons must be substantiated uh, by evidence um, so that you can demonstrate reasonable planning grounds for, for taking a decision contrary to, uh, to, to the recommendation. Um, so, Chair, I've heard some of the, some of the debate um, sort of just following, following what, what's being said, and it does, it does seem as though self-build, five-year housing supply, carbon neutral, um, the fact that Farrell's a growth hub, and uh, the sustainability around the footpath. So essentially, the, the reasons which were put forward previously, those still seem to be um, the reasons which members uh, are keen to, to, to put forward in support of the application, notwithstanding the, the, the officer's um, report and, and, um, and advice. Um, and the, but, the, but just remind you, Chair, that there's three reasons for refusal that, um, that the members need to address um, for, um, uh, for us to progress. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, OK, then. So with that, uh, Councillor Rice, did you want to um, uh, propose uh, a, a recommendation? Yes. I'll take it from there. Yes, certainly. I mean, Lee has obviously touched on it. Um, uh, number one would be the lack of the five year housing supply. And we've got no 20 percent buffer of housing supply. Um, and we'd obviously lend with the officers to give that substantial weight. Um, the scheme is carbon neutral and provides custom self-built homes would give that moderate weight. Uh, Thurrock is a national growth hub, um, which is a substantial weight, and the development would be a 12-minute walk to the train station and the local shops once the proposed footpath was in place through the country path, so it would be sustainable. And obviously, this would be met under the unilateral undertaking which the applicants have entered into um, and would be covered by that. So those are the reasons um, for departure. We obviously recognise, Chair, and it's important to recognise it, that uh, we recognise there would be harm to the green belt um, because that is important. Um, and it's for those reasons, Chair, that uh, I would uh, suggest that we uh, proceed this evening. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, picking up on, on, on where you left off there, Councillor Rice, I mean, obviously you cited quite a few reasons there, uh, which, I, which I think can be attacked under item one for refusal. Uh, item two is the proposed location would create a, an isolated residential development. Uh, as I've raised in the past, um, actually it's the uh, development's isolation. I think it gives residents choice of where they where they may want to live and uh, on that basis i'd cite current developments such as langdon hills which is very recent uh, the hospice site in Bolvan, which is very recent both of which sites are isolated um, and on that basis uh, are, are, are similar in nature in terms of uh, remoteness in terms of uh, item three uh, that development in scale is in close proximity of the designated uh, heritage ads assets as raised at the last meeting, the site itself is quite enclosed. It is next to uh, the orbital uh, motorway, the M25. And I know Matt did mention it, that from certain UN angles, uh, it, it would be impacted, but on the basis of its uh, location, on the basis that it's, you know, it's not a 360 degree impact, um, it's only a limited impact based on uh, whether you're north, south, east or west. Um, I, it's something that I think, um, you know, we can afford weight that it's uh, it's not a, a huge impact. So, Lee, bringing you in there, obviously you would have had Lee, uh, you would have had Councillor Rice's recommendation uh, for item one. And obviously I've, I've raised why I think it's acceptable based on arguments two and three. Uh, would you like to come in there? Thank you, Chair. Um, so, the, um, the the weighting uh, that that you would give to the, to the factors is 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 down to the decision maker, which in this in which is in this instance is is the planning committee. Um, I think you've made your um, case 
uh, clear. You've put you've put you've put to put the points over, and um, I've obviously been listening to debate for the past hour or so, so I can 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 see which uh, which way members might need to move on this one. Um, what I ought to do, though, again, constitutionally, is to refer to the council's legal um, officer in case um, Caroline had any input at this at this point. Subject to whatever uh, legal might say, um, Chair, if the members are looking to to, to approve, um, what I'd suggest is that we would need to make sure that that is subject to um, conditions, Section 106, as, be, as, as has been spoken about, um, and um, also, as, as usual, subject to, uh, to reference to um, the Council's uh, monitoring officer. Um, and... I'm just looking on this case to see whether it would need to be referred. Perhaps Matt can very quickly tell me whether this would also need to be referred, in which case we would need to, to refer to the Secretary of State. But, we, but, but, but whilst we're doing that, if I can just pass to, uh, to, lead, to the legal officer, Chair. Thank um, you. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I, um, you know, it will be down to the monitoring officer to, um, um, you know, after this, you know, after this meeting um, to consider whether um, the reasons do are sufficient. Um, yeah, I, 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 I just think it, you know, it's probably best to refer this to the monitoring officer because members are very clearly do want to um, vote in favour um, and if given reasons, um, if given their weight. Um, and I think probably there isn't much else to say except, uh, you know, pass it to consideration for monitoring officer. Um, Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Matthew. I understand you've got a hand up. Yeah, just to confirm that point Lee um, alluded to, so it would um, be a referral to the Secretary of State. So that's the planning casework unit because it's um, what's defined as green belt development. So um, referral to the monitoring officer in the first instance, and then it's conditions to be drafted Agreed with the chair and Lee. I think the usual protocol um, heads of terms for a UU, or even though we have some progression with that already, um, then referral to the Secretary of State. And once we have a decision back, then it's finalisation of 106, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, before um, a decision can be issued. So we could be, um, yeah, and I know Councillor Rice said at the outset, I mean, this is where the time goes. No, no, thank you. Um... Uh, yeah, thank you for, for the comments there. Lee, just uh, another thought. I know you was um, uh, uh, noting that whilst uh, Legal and, and Matthew were speaking. I've referenced Langdon Hills and, and the hospice site in Baldwin. I, I was thinking as well, uh, and, and Matthew mentioned it, that actually the original site itself would have had an impact on heritage. And obviously that was approved by, we, we believe, a previous planning committee. So again, in, in reference to similar uh, decisions, it might be worth adding that. But I fully support this going to the monitoring officer and then Secretary of State, if needs be. Uh, if you're happy for us to move to the vote, uh, we'll, uh, we'll move on. That's fine, Chair. Thank you. OK, thank you. So uh, with that, uh, Councillor Rice has uh, proposed a alternative recommendation, which is approval. And uh, I'm happy to second that. So we'll now head to the vote. Uh, agenda item eight, Kemp's Farm. 20 stroke 01394 stroke OUT uh, is up for approval. Uh, all those in favour, please show me your hands digitally. Okay, uh, count one, two, three, four, five. Um, five votes in favour. Uh, Councillor Lawrence. I'm just uh, in trouble. There we go. Excellent, thank you. Okay, so that's one, two, three, four, five, six votes in favour. And uh, please uh, lower your hands. And for those uh, against approval, uh, please raise your hand. That's Councillor um, Potter, Shinnick, Fletcher. Sorry, Councillors Potter, Shinnick. Hang on. No, I think Councillor Potter was four. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's perfect. Um, yeah, definitely. Sorry. No, that's absolutely fine. No worries. Um, and then I've got Councillors uh, Fletcher and Shinnick against. Okay, uh, Wendy, are you happy with that, that that was a vote for approval? 
Yes, Chair. Brilliant. Thank you very much. All right, then. So with that, uh, agenda item eight, uh, subject to referral to the managing officer and uh, the Secretary of State, Kent's Farm, has been approved. All right, then. So that now actually moves us on to item, agenda, uh, item 10, which is uh, Woodlands Coy Farm. Obviously, um, item nine was removed. Uh, this is 21 stroke 00156 stroke FUL. And uh, uh, Lucy, I understand you'll be so kind just to present a report. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, Chair. I'll just try and share my screen. Okay, hopefully everyone can see that. Okay. Right, the application is for full planning permission for construction of a single storey detached annex following demolition of an existing outbuilding. The annex is for a family member. So this slide shows the location plan. The application site is broadly rectangular, located along South Avenue, which is accessed by a South Hill in Langdon Hills. The site is within Greenbelt. This aerial photograph shows the site in the middle. You can see the site is in a secluded position. Langdon Ridge site of special scientific interest is to the north of the site. All right, this shows the proposed location of the, the development within the site. The main house is to the left with the proposed annex footprint over the dash footprint of the present outbuilding at the site. So this, this slide shows the elevations, floor and roof plans of the proposed one bedroom dwelling. And this plan shows the existing outbuilding which is an amalgamation of different forms, is not a lawful structure on the site. The permitted development rights were removed on the site in the 2008 planning application for the new house. The outbuilding as it is now has been significantly extended within the last few years without planning permission. Okay, this is a view of the site the present outbuilding on the site facing south. This is the eastern side of the outbuilding. This is the rear of the outbuilding near to the southern boundary of the site. And this is the western side of the outbuilding. And this is the rear of the outbuilding facing northwest within the site. And in the background, you can see the main house. Okay, this is some aerial imagery from 2014, showing that the outbuilding, which is in the, the right-hand kind of corner of the site, so much smaller than it is today. The additions have not got planning permission which is required as the site does not benefit from permitted development rights. Therefore, the entire structure that it is today is unlawful and cannot be used as part of the case for the annex. And this is imagery from 2018, which shows the outbuilding, isn't it? Was two separate outbuildings, so there's been more development since 2018. Okay, the site is within Greenbelt and would not fall within one of the exceptions to inappropriate development as set out in the MPPF and local policies. Therefore, it would result in inappropriate development in the Greenbelt, which is harmful by definition and harmful to openness. The applicant has not advanced any circumstances which would amount to very special circumstances that would overcome the strong presumption against this type of proposal. There were two very special circumstances put forward, which were assessed in paragraph 6.23 onwards within the planning report. And this was removal of an incongruous building, um, which can't give any weight to because the incongruous building has been erected by the applicant. It's recently added and is unlawful. And the per 
the second very special circumstance with the personal circumstances of the proposed occupiers who are the um, the applicants parents but personal circumstances do not outweigh the public interest and the harm to the green belt okay to summarize the development is inappropriate development in green belt which is harmful by de definition harmful to openness and harmful to the purposes of green belt the very special circumstances put forward do not outweigh the harm of the proposal to conclude, the recommendation is to refuse the application for the reason that was set out in paragraph 8.1 of the report. Okay, thank you. Um, right, so we're now open up to uh, questions. Um, I think, uh, Councillor Fletcher. Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks for that, Lucy. Appreciate your, uh, your presentation. Uh, just want to check, so that outbuilding which has been described as unlawful. Looking at the pictures, clearly not all of that building was built four years ago. There, there appears to be a core that, would, that is old. Is that correct? Yeah, there's a section. Um, I can go back to the 2014 um, photograph if you want. But there's a small section which appears to have been, been on the site for, for more longer. than... 10 years so it could be lawful but the i'd say over over two-thirds of the outbuilding is is definitely unlawful yeah i get that now remind me the the building that's being proposed um is that covering the site of the the existing building or is it covering any of the site of the the unlawful building uh, it, it, it is partly yeah it would be partly the um the part of the building which is lawful but it would it would be much larger than that original outbuilding and also because of the works that have been done the whole structure now is unlawful Including the bit that was there before. Yeah, as it as it stands today. Really? Yeah, because you've joined an unlawful structure to what was a lawful structure, so the whole structure is then unlawful. So technically, it kind of backdates itself. Well, technically, they could remove all the unlawful parts, and then what was lawful could be lawful again. I hope right. that makes sense which effectively, as I understand it, is what they're looking to do, and then build this granny annex on the lawful bit, for want of a more technical term. Yeah, not, not at all, because it, what they're proposing now is more than the entirety of the outbuilding as it stands today. Mm -hmm. So you have to replace like with like. Right. So what they're proposing is is a lot a lot larger. Mm. Yeah, I saw from the notes. It's is it what ten centimeters higher? Yeah, than what's there today. Which is, to be honest, ten centimeters is. Yeah, I know I I know I'm a bloke, but I would say that's not a lot. Um, okay, I'm trying to sort of get an idea. Appreciate that obviously a lot of that building shouldn't be there. But my understanding was that um, what the applicant was trying to do was make use of the building that should be there uh, and in doing so take down the one that shouldn't have been there in the first place. Mm, that's no. So they're trying to replace the building that is there today yeah. with a building that's slightly larger, whereas the lawful, the original lawful part of the building that was on the site yeah it's it's tiny it's, it's a smaller part okay all right yeah that's that sort of helps me to get correct but, um in terms of you've been around the area a few times um as i've sort of seen it there are a few properties in that sort of general area have got um sort of similar or taller um buildings so it's, it wouldn't be a totally unusual building for the for the area would it 
Um, no, I suppose not. But the issue with with this site, I'm sure you know, Council Fletcher, is there's a lot of planning history. Yeah, I've looked at and other, <laughs> yeah. yeah, and other development, other yeah. structures which have been allowed on the site. And to back in 2008, when there was the unfortunate um, fire, mm. well, the 2008 application for the house, which resulted from that unfortunate event, that the permitted development rights for this site were removed. Yeah. To kind of allow that that property. So other plots within the green belt. So it's a bit of a trade-off. Yes, yes. Yeah. So other properties in the area may well have their permitted development rights still. Right. So they kind of lost out really as a result of that trade-off. Um well no, because it was a trade-off back in two thousand eight. So mm. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you Councillor uh, Fletcher. Thanks, Lucy. Um, yeah. Uh, Steve Taylor. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, hi, Lucy. I'm not sure if you were there. This has come up many times in certainly in my memory of sitting on this committee. And the last time it came up, Councillor Fletcher, do you want to turn your mic? Oh, bloody hell. Sorry, man. <laughs> That's all right. Thank you. Um, and the last time they were, as, and I'm doing this from memory, but my recollection was that they were they needed an outbuilding to put equipment in that they needed, which was part of their business, and it it was in principle not allowed, uh, although we did allow it because we viewed that it, it was something necessary for their business. But it was made very clear at that time, I think, that their permitted development had been withdrawn previously and this was being allowed purely because it assisted them in running their business and it was also made very clear at that time that that from my recollection was the end of it and they weren't going to be allowed anything else and and as is usually the case with some of the you know some a, a number of applications they then come back again and they want to go again three or four years down the road and probably in the sure and certain knowledge that the people that are going to deal with it perhaps don't always recall what went on in the past. I, I don't know. Were you the? I'm not sure. I don't think you were the uh, the um, officer dealing with it last time. I've got yeah. half a feeling it was Matthew, but you might have been. I can't remember. Uh, yes, Steve. I, well, I was the case officer, but I didn't present to committee at that time. So yeah, Matthew presented it. But yeah, every, everything you said is is completely correct. So, so I'm right in saying we've been through this loop with the same applicant, uh, and for the for the right reasons, allowed them to build the building they needed to to carry on and continue and improve their business. But again, it was made clear at that time that that was the end of it. And I think it was also said at the time, this isn't a building you can subsequently turn into another property on the site. And it sort of sounds like that's where we're going with this. And. Uh, uh, have I got, is my memory failing me? I, I know I'm getting too bloody old now. <laughs> no, your your memory is is perfect. All that you've okay. said is correct. So there was a, a building which was approved, obviously it's inappropriate development, but it was approved because it was um, helping a rural business. So we went through whether it's actually necessary for their business yeah. and and it was. No, that, that's great. Thanks, Lucy. I. I I was just trying to make sure I hadn't, hadn't got this site mixed up with another one. So, no, that's great. Thanks, Lucy. Excellent. Okay, thank you, Steve. Yeah, so Lucy, picking up on that point, I do, 2019, I do remember this application. So, we're talking, this uh, this storage building that was up for refusal, I remember we gave it the uh, approval so they could obviously carry out their business. So, they're saying they don't need that no more. Is this, is this the building? No, um, Chair. The rural, the business, uh, the building for their, their rural business, their fish business, that was recommended for approval by um, officers and members agreed on that. So that is in a different part of the site. And last time I was at the site, which because of the um, circumstances at the moment, probably about a year ago now, they hadn't 
started building that, but it will still be a valid application, an extant application. They'll still be able to start that. So it's not, it's, it's completely separate. Okay, thank you. And then in terms of the building, uh, the demolishing of the existing outbuilding that's, um, that's already oversized, what, what, is the council treating that separately? So let's say it's approved, let's say it's rejected. If it is rejected, there's still an issue, an outstanding issue there, that there's a building that's, that's too large for its location. Yeah, it would have to um, take enforcement action. Okay, and then I, I remember we've had these cases before where applications are submitted and we're told that obviously um, it's to help relatives move in, um, etc. Um, is it backed up? Is there, have we got anything uh, backing up medically? Because um, I know in the past that's been asked um, in those scenarios, we asked for proof of, of, of why people would need to move in. Is, is there anything there that we can work with? Yeah. There's there's a couple of, of points on this. There has been some information put forward, but um, I believe the speaker statements will go into more detail. It's not really my place to um, speak about people's health. Um, but the other point is that the, um, the family members in question live 450 metres away from the site at the present time. So... That is something which we have to take into consideration that okay. they're already nearby for, for care, caring needs. Yeah, okay, then no, no, that, that makes sense. And then lastly, just to confirm, if it was to be built, um, what would what would stop the site being sold at a later date? So is there anything in there that says this is uh, an annex for this certain medical situation and then that's it, or it's nothing? If it gets built, the, the applicants will be able to do what they want with it, effectively sell it if, if they so choose and move elsewhere. Yeah, well, because it's a recommendation for refusal, conditions haven't been um, drafted, but there would there would be a condition to ensure that it's... It's ancillary for um, yes, yeah, an ancillary for family members. So if they went to sell it, they wouldn't be able to sell it as a, an additional property. Yeah, without further planning permission. Yes. Okay then. No, all right. Thank you. Um, well, I've got no further questions there. Um, no other hands have raised. And uh, Wendy, I understand we have some speaker statements. Would you like to uh, take those forwards and uh, invite the relevant uh, individuals? Yes, Chair. The first speaker statement is from Councillor Johnson. So, Councillor Johnson, if you would like to go. Thanks, Wendy. Can you hear me, uh, committee? Yes, thank you. Uh, okay. So, good evening, members, and thank you, Chair, for uh, allowing me to speak. I am aware of the need to protect our green, but in fact, I'm well aware of it and all the rules and regulations that have been introduced to do so. However, some of them, I think, are open to interpretation, and in this case, particularly so. It begins with the proposal of the application, erection of a single storey detached annex following demolition of existing outbuilding. I've stood in a neighbouring property and I can assure the committee that the whole property is that far away, it's practically invisible. And the addition of this building does not to appear to me to add any real extra height to the property. I note that four comments were received, two in favour, two against. The two against citing loss of openness and a, an amenity, which as I said, I viewed the site from the closest property to the left of the farm as you look at it, and that simply is not the case. In paragraph six, titled assessment, we're shown the principal issues to be considered where it is necessary to refer to the key questions of inappropriate development. I think that this is negated by the fact that this is a building that is replacing an existing building. The effect of the proposal on the open nature of the green belt, which again is negated, as much of the surrounding fields and open space are above the farm anyway. And with clever planting, I would imagine the new building becoming completely unnoticeable. It also goes on to look at the harm to the green belt outweighing other considerations. Here again, I, I cannot see any harm to the green belt, as there is already a residential property with an outbuilding which is being replaced. 
If I may continue, I would like to explore the five purposes which paragraph 134 of the NPPF sets out to protect. And that's to check the unrestricted sprawl of large built up areas, which this site does not increase in size and officers agree these proposals will not result in the sprawling of an existing large built up area. It is to prevent neighbouring towns from merging. Well, anybody that has visited this site can see this is clearly not the case here. And again, officers agree the development would not conflict to any significant degree. It goes on to assist in safeguarding the countryside from encroachment. Well, I repeat, I don't think this site increases in size, so there's, there's no visible encroachment. Although officers would appear to question the lawfulness of the existing building, which of course the applicant disputes. To preserve the setting and special character of historic towns, officers agree again, this is not applicable here. However, I believe the sympathetic nature of the build is in keeping with the surroundings. And finally, to assist, assist in urban regeneration by encouraging the recycling of derelict and other land. I have to admit, I don't fully understand the officer's explanation regarding this purpose, but I do not see any objection from them. And I was of the opinion that the building to be demolished and replaced does exactly that. Chair, it reads to me that out of the five purposes defined within the MPPF, officers only object to one of them. So I would question their statement in paragraph 6.1, whereby they state, having established that the proposals are inappropriate development, as I see no real clear evidence of this. But finally, Chair, I would like to point out that this accommodation would assist greatly in allowing a couple who are not in the best of health to live very close to family in what would be their forever home and considerably improve their mental health and feelings of security. As being on the doorstep is a lot different to being 450 metres away. So thank you for listening. Okay, thank you, uh, uh, Councillor Johnson. Um, Wendy, uh, we'll uh, bring you back for the next uh, statement. Yes, Chair, the next statement is from the applicant Mr. John Cross, and he's asked me to read it out on their behalf. I'm applying to build a granny annex in the grounds of my property to house my elderly parents. My father has osteoarthritis of the spine, asthma, and a number of other health issues, including Crohn's disease. He is 83 years old, and my mother is 80, and although in reasonable health, she is a small lady and is finding it more and more difficult to cope as she has rheumatoid arthritis in her hands, arms, and feet. Rather than be a burden on the local local services they want to be looked after by myself and my son and do not want to go into sheltered housing or a home i'm in the process of building an oak framed property myself and would like the granny annex to be built in the same style as to be in keeping with the main dwelling and the area we live in in this application the annex will be a lot smaller than the previous application and will be lowered in the ground making it less visible and replacing an outbuilding that was built in 1972 also, we intend to share an electric meter, a sewage treatment plant and a gas sphere. My mother, Vera, also adds that we built our three bedroom property when we were still quite young and there wasn't the regulations about then like there is now. Consequently, it's not wheelchair friendly. There are nine steps to the front door and three steps to the back door. The property and garden is far too big for us to handle now. Brian, my husband, has arthritis of the spine, asthma and Crohn's disease, which needs a special diet, so we need our own kitchen. I have rheumatoid arthritis in my arms, hands and feet, so we badly need our son's help. He cannot come to us at the drop of a hat, so it would be much better and safer for us in the grounds of his fish farm, leaving our property available to a family. Neither of us are cap capable of doing the things we once found easy. Our bodies can't do what our minds would like to do, as we are both still young. we are still both young at heart. We have lowered our proposed one bedroom annex and will also go down into the ground to make it even lower and less visible. Also, we'll, we will be exchanging it for an outbuilding that was built in 1972. Okay, thank you, Wendy. And uh, that's, uh, that's that for this week's statement, yeah? Yeah, that's it for this one. Okay, uh, based on that, were there any further comments, uh, members, or any further questions? Uh, Councillor Fletcher. Uh, to be honest, Chair, I'd like to sort of move into the debate. So I was—I just put my hand up a bit early, possibly. Yeah, no, go. You can—you can start the debate, Councillor Fletcher. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, 
I've taken an interest in this particular development um, for a number of reasons, and not least because I've been through this um, in the last few years with my own father. When my mother died, my father was stuck in the family house for about four or five years. Um, it was an unsuitable accommodation. It was too big. The stairs were an issue. Um, and we eventually did uh, help him to move into a home. It's, it, it worked for him. doesn't necessarily work for everybody. But I suppose I'd like to say that I totally get the, um, the reasons that have been put forward, that, that Lucy's put forward, and totally understand that taken very black in a very black and white way, this is um, not the most obvious proposal to back. But I do think you know, one of the reasons why we as a committee have been asked to look at it is there is more to it than just the... Um, the area covered, the height of the new building, whether the old building was, um, you know, should have been, should or shouldn't have been put up in the first place. One thing I'd like to point out is that the applicant has engaged for the last few months in trying to change the uh, plans to comply as far as possible with officers. And I was very encouraged to hear what Lucy was saying that, you know, were this uh, proposal to be uh, approved that um, it would be possible to uh, to set some restrictions around further sale. I believe that given what the applicants have done so far, there's a good chance that they will uh, be happy to comply with those kind of conditions. Um, the fact that the parents are currently 450 metres away, as, uh, as Barry's already said, and as Wendy read out from the parents, you can be 450 metres away, but it's not necessarily the same as being um, next door. But for me, more importantly, the parents want to move into a small one-storey place and free up a larger two-storey building, which would then become available for a family for whom it's more appropriate. We've talked, and Gerard um, rightly mentions the, the lack of housing in Thurrock. OK, we're only talking about one house, but this is one opportunity at least for a larger property to become available for a family with more appropriate accommodation that to me is an important plus uh, secondly I think the um, sorry I'm just reading my notes here I think the the question of health and the question of age really do need to be listened to need to be taken into account quite appreciate they don't fit into uh housing regulations planning regulations which is one of the reasons why we as a committee listen to or occasionally call in applications like this because there is another element what i would ask my fellow uh, councillors to think about is if you're in this situation if it were your parents do you feel that this would be that it would be appropriate to allow, or would you still be thinking, no, this is not something that I can back? We're not talking about a large, invasive um, building on Greenbelt. We're talking about a reuse, if you like, of an outbuilding, which I think is, is going to have minimal impact. It is going to harm the Greenbelt, totally get that but it is going to make life so much easier for an elderly couple and it's going to free up a property for more appropriate accommodation. I'm starting to repeat myself, so I'll, I'll stop there. OK, thank you, Councillor Fletcher. I think Councillor Lawrence was next. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I understand what Councillor Fletcher is saying about this and it does all pull on your heartstrings. But I do agree with Lucy on this one, and I don't think this is straightforward as it seems. Um, we have given leeway before in past planning applications, and I do remember them, and I do agree with what um, Steve Taylor said. And uh, I am also a little bit surprised, actually, by the other wall council who spoke this for all SIP, because uh, one of the past applications, the same sort of thing happened, and it pulled on my heartstrings. And then I was notified by council a little that within six months, the parents were put in a home after the planning had got been given the go ahead. 
So we have got to be wary of this sort of thing because you can't say no to one and yes to another and it could go on and on. So I think we do have to be careful, but on this one, I agree with Lucy and um, it's a no for me, I'm afraid. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Lawrence. Yeah, I remember the case you're talking about. Um, yes, yeah, certainly has similarities. I think um, I think with that one, it was it was an add-on to the house as opposed to uh, an annex. But yeah, you are right. We was the wall was pulled over our eyes. I think on that one. Um, and yeah, you are right. It's, it's something that, that we need to be aware of. Um, that I mean, on that particular case, yeah, we we gave it the green light, and and it would appear that you know the it would appear that we was we was tricked to touch, but obviously you have to look at everything individually. This is slightly separate in the fact that it's an annex. There may be something we can do, but yeah, I'm not sure where to go with this one yet. Uh, let's see what Councillor Rice and Councillor Salmons have to say. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, well, I'm mindful to support Councillor Johnson in his remarks and also Councillor Fletcher. Um, you know, we do have to think about... Um, elderly people um and and, I, and it's for those reasons i would lend my support this evening to this because i think it's so important to uh, look after our elderly people i mean one day even i might be elderly and i might need to be looked after but it is important and i'm fully supporting councillor fletcher um and uh, be happy to vote for this because i think it's a very worthwhile scheme Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Sammons. Yes, sorry, I think okay, I'm sorry, I'm sort of trying to keep up with it, but I agree. If they're just trying to sort of propose out building and keep quite on site though, I think they'd probably be better gone and made could you to the space for the parents. I mean It is to say they only looked up the road, but if you're working, you've got a busy life. You can't pop up the road every five minutes. I think it'd be much more feasible to have the parents living on site. Oh, I'm quite in favour of them. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Sammons. All right, so we've got a few more hands raised up now. Uh, I think. Councillor Fletcher, Councillor Lawrence, and uh, well, uh, John Keane. I think you had your hand. You've lowered that now, though. Um, right, so we'll go to Councillor Fletcher. Thanks, Chair. Um, just wanted to say I absolutely um, understand what Councillor Lawrence was saying, and I think she's got a point. You don't want to be... Um, you don't want the wool pulled over your eyes. I do think, from what we've been discussing earlier, that there are ways we can put conditions on our approval... Uh, particularly around resale, to make that less of a problem. I don't see it as a reason for refusal. I do see it as a reason to be careful in how we approve. Yeah, and no, I, under, I understand what you're saying, Councillor Fletcher, and, and this is a difficult one. I'm, I must admit, I'm, I'm slightly nervous at, at the history of the site. I mean, obviously, we, we gave that uh, site approval for the construction building. Uh, that was back in 19. I mean, that's that's not been completed yet. Whether we like it or not, there is a, a building on site that's uh, that's been built out without permission. Um, so again, it's it really is a tough one. What, uh, Councillor Lawrence and then Jonathan Keane? Uh, Thank you, Chair. I'll, I'd just like to go with what you just said about there is building on here at the moment. What we've got to be sorted out before we give extra building application. I think things should be sorted out first and um, perhaps this should come back at a later time after everything has been discussed and everything's been cleared. And also, I'd just like to say this is one of the reasons why I voted for the Langdon Retirement Village. This is exactly the same situation for elderly residents who need proper care and to be looked after and not to be isolated, just relying on their children. So there are other options out there. Okay, thank you. And then uh, uh, Jonathan Keane, would you like to come in? And then we might have to start. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Just wanted to pick up a couple of points from the, the debate and the discussions. Um, I think members need to be really clear that the building that's there at the moment is unlawful, um, that the council could be taking in enforcement action against it because the building doesn't have permission 
it's in breach of conditions previously put on the site when the building was given permission um, for the new dwelling in 2008 and that the size of the building proposed now is about four times the size of the smallest part of the outbuilding that is potentially lawful. So those are the sort of background issues you need to have in mind. Um, there were some other points raised by members about the fact that the building would be difficult to see and therefore it wouldn't have a harm on the impact, harm on the impact of the green belt. Um, I think as we've raised a couple of times in the past, the green belt issue is a spatial issue as much as a visual issue. So anything that's built will have a harmful impact on the, the on the green belt and the openness of the green belt. So the fact that members don't think it can be seen isn't something that would count in its favour. Um, just looking back in the planning history again, um, in 2015, a very similar proposal was dismissed at appeal. Um, and in dismissing the appeal, the inspector had considered the case put forward by the applicant at the time that there were some buildings to be removed and also the case of the applicant's family and their medical concerns. Um, and the inspector in dismissing that appeal said he notes the arguments in support of the scheme and the annex would provide accommodation for the applicant's elderly parents. Um, but he found the impact of the proposal on the openness of the green belt was clear breach of both national and development plan policy and the, the very special circumstances put forward, which was the loss of some buildings on the site and the applicant's personal circumstances didn't overcome that harm to the green belt. So we've had a similar appeal decision in the last six years on this very similar proposals on the same site. And there's nothing in this application that I feel is different from that from that decision. So certainly the, the point I'd like you to take away is that the building that's proposed to be replaced isn't lawful, um, is unauthorised and has been put up without consent. There is significant harm considered from the proposal on the green belt. Thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, we'll go to Steve Taylor, then Councillor Potter. Thanks, Chair. It is sort of probably this is not really in debate. It's a, it's a bit of a question for Lucy. But am I right in saying that the so the application that was approved for a building on the site to enable them to carry on and grow their business, they've not built. That hasn't happened. I, I can't say 100 percent, but um, last time I was at the site, there was no start on this. And also as well, another point which. Um, I'll just raise seeing as. Um, we've been talking about the history of the site is the replacement house on the site hasn't been finished and that there was a condition on that replacement house that they could have a mobile home on the site until the house was occupied and that that situation has been going on for 10 years as well thanks thanks lucy so so that says to me that there is a history and i kind of recall lots of this of people effectively um, pushing their luck, chancing their arm and so on. Some of some of it we approve for the right reason, i.e. a building so they could continue their business. So it crosses my mind that a sensible compromise here might be to do a couple of things. One is, um, first of all, get them to finish the house that they got the planning permission for originally. Secondly, deal with the outbuilding extensions that are illegal development. And thirdly, give up the building to grow their business and use that uh, and exchange that, if you like, for the ability to deal with the issue with their parents. And that's a kind of a then it's seen. Uh, my view of that is it's a bit of a compromise, um, but it strikes me that every time I've heard an application around this site, it's always been more, more, more. And, and as you've just pointed out, none of that's been completed satisfactorily. Yes. Steve, agree with you on the, the first two points, but the third one is um, a no, because the only reason that that structure was allowed was because it was for a rural business use. Ah, OK. All right. All right. It's, it's just a thought in my mind, but that just goes to how stupid I am. So, yeah. Oh, well, there you go. Thanks, OK. Lisa. OK, thank you, Steve. Uh, interesting points there. And then Councillor Potter, then we'll sum up. Uh, Councillor Potter. Yeah, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Would it be a good idea if the applicant was to demolish all the unlawfully built buildings and then come back at a later point with a clean sheet and reapply. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Potter. I mean, picking up on that point, um, as I said, it, it's an emotive decision. It's a difficult one to come to come up with. Um, I understand the, the sides of the argument. I must say I'm very nervous at, at the history of this site. I think ultimately, when we're looking at uh, applications uh, uh, that have not been fulfilled, when we're looking at buildings on site that are unlawful, when we look at this one from 2019, strictly speaking, that's still within date. So in a sense, I suppose you can't really hold that one against them. But I do remember that look, the, the point of giving that one approval against officer recommendation was, you know, so they cracked on and used it for for, for their business. And it just seems that this site is, is riddled with, with um, concern. And I think also the fact that there is a current unlawful building on site, um, it suggests to me that really the message isn't a great one if it was to be approved, because ultimately we're almost saying it's, it's sort of acceptable when in planning terms it's not. So it is a tough one. It is a motive, but the site is edged with problems here. You are right, Councillor Potter. If they went away, cleaned everything up, then come to us separately, I think that would change it. Clearly, time's not on their side in terms of the circumstance, but look, ultimately, I don't think that's something that, that the council can be held responsible for. So it's, uh, I was on the fence, but I think now it's it's become clear that this is, uh, yeah, too, too risky in terms of the, the message it sends out. But I understand, uh, you know, whatever direction you go on this one. Uh, Councillor Fletcher. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just wondering, to be honest, I believe that uh, approving gives us more action, more opportunity to. We just talked about um, some of the things we'd like to see on this site. Approval doesn't really give. Uh, sorry, refusal doesn't really give you any leverage. Approval will, um, if we're concerned about uh, applications taking forever. All right, put a put a limit, as we have done on other applications. Put a limit on how long this planning permission lasts, uh, and if no building is is put up in that time then it lapses. Uh, if we're concerned about, well, obviously we're concerned about the, uh, the building that, uh, th that the officers consider unlawful. Um, fine, make that a, a well, I'm, I, I'm sure it will be um, a precondition of any uh, further building. Um, I believe we have more opportunity to try and sort out some of the obviously not brilliant history of this site as conditions for approval than just by refusing and presumably seeing the same thing come back at us in a different guise in six months to a year's time is, as you said, the big issue for me is that, and you know, without being uh, unfair on the uh, on the parents, they've not got forever. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you, Councillor Fletcher. Yeah, I think it's really just going to come down to, to what people's opinions are on the vote. Um, just very quickly, Lucy, looking at this, this long list of history, you've got the application of a temporary site of a mobile home. You've got the demolition of the existing dwelling, which was approved, as was the mobile home. But obviously that was only temporary. And then you've got the construction of the storage building. You could argue that all these approvals, not one of them has been fulfilled, has it not? Um, the construction of the storage building, that's not been complete. There was a suggestion there that the building... The existing building and construction of two new bedroom dwelling you, you suggested that's not complete either yeah. and the temporary site of a mobile home well that's not temporary because that was back in 2005 so nothing that we've approved here has actually been followed through with yeah if you put it that way that is correct um last time i was at the site and i've been there quite a few times now the um the two new two bedroom house which you may remember was in the foreground of one of the photos of the outbuilding that was being used for storage for the business but obviously they've got the permission for a storage building now but yet yeah, until yeah. they okay. right. build that then they can't then move into the house and then the um, mobile home would then due to the condition on the 2018 application need to be removed there's also, whilst I'm on, there's also a couple of other points I just wanted to clarify. First one is, um, Chair, you've said a couple of times now that the um, the storage building was recommended for refusal by officers. It wasn't. It was recommended for approval, just to clarify on that. And um, Councillor Fletcher said 
that if we approve the application, we'll have more control. I I can't agree on that. And I think if it's a refusal, then we can take enforcement action. Or we would take enforcement action, which is which is a control. So it's yeah, not no, no, I understand where you're coming from. But yeah. no, thanks, thanks for that. Um obviously it's good that you uh, you clarify those points. So thank you. Um right, we'll go Shinnick and then we'll, we'll sorry, Councillor Shinnick and then we'll head to the boat. I get called that a lot. <laughs> All right, I'd just like to say I agree with Councillor Potter. We need to get these existing approvals dealt with first before I consider for this building. Thank you. Okay then. All right then. I think that's everyone. I think we've had a, a fair debate on this particular item. So what we'll do, as we always do, we'll, we'll head to the uh, officer recommendation and we'll see where we end up um, after that. So there's a, there's a recommendation 8.0, and that's pages 107. Um, and that there, well, it's actually recommendation 8.0 and 107, but the reasons set out are on page 108. Uh, that's 8.1, ref, refuse for the following reasons. Um, I'd, I could recommend that. Uh, is that seconded? Sorry, Chair. Yeah. Based on what Councillor Shinnick has been uh, uh, suggesting, may we introduce an alternative motion to defer? What um what what were your reasons for, for on the defer? grounds that well to defer until the previous work has been completed? Um well let's I mean to be honest with you I mean this stuff's been going on for nearly fifteen years now but um I'll bring in the officers let's see where we end up and uh, Jonathan uh, what's the rules etc. We've got in terms of deferring till everything else is completed we've got no mechanism as such to um or no mechanism to ensure the works are completed at this point um the 2008 application which has commenced they they'd have a period in which to commence the development but they don't have an end date to to finish the works and we can't retrospectively apply a time limit to it so we can't make them finish the house we can't make them build the storage building either so there's nothing that we can do to actually get them to build that one or finish the house within a certain time period. Okay, thank you. Thanks, John. Uh, Councillor Ross. I, I was just trying to be helpful uh, so that we fully understand this. Perhaps we could have a site visit. Um, okay. Uh, uh, yeah, no, I understand that. Um, yeah, I mean, what, how do we, in terms of retiring members, because obviously quite a lot of you are retiring. Um, officers, how does that work? Um, Chair, yeah, sorry. Visit. Um, so about site visit, we can't hold site visits yet until we receive further guidance. And we need to ensure COVID secure workplace when it comes to site visits. And in terms of um, retiring members, so if a site uh, visit was proposed for this application, as it goes through, only the remaining members from this current committee, if they are going to be on the next committee, would be going on a site visit. OK, no, thank you, Wendy. That's uh, loud and clear. So obviously that will be in mind when we go to the vote. Um, if yeah, that's sorry. seconded. It's also almost 8.30. You might want to suspend standing orders. OK, yeah, right. So just to clarify, I'd like to suspend standing orders for the remainder of the meeting. Is that confirmed? Agreed. OK, that's agreed. Um, obviously, members, you will be aware that if we do defer and go to a site visit, um, it, it, we could be looking at only a couple of members, two, three, four, maybe, uh, being able to vote next time round. And obviously, Councillor Rice, that has been proposed. My only thing, the only thing I would say to that is at the moment, I don't think it's the site visit that's, that, that's the issue surrounding this particular application, which is why I won't vote for it. But that has been proposed. Um, is that seconded? Site visit seconded by anyone? Um, no, that's uh, Councillor Fletcher. OK, so a site visit had been recommend, uh, recommended. Uh, all those in favour of a site visit, please show me your hands digitally. Okay, I'll count three hands in favour of a site visit. Uh, all those against, please show your hands digitally. 
and obviously put your hands down if you voted originally. Okay, it's one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so that uh, motion of a site visit has been uh, defeated. Okay, then, so we, we, we go where we left off, which was the recommendation um, 8.0 on page 107, leading on to 108, which is to refuse. Um, is that second, is? I've proposed by myself. Uh, Councillor Shinnick uh, has seconded that. Okay, then, so with that, um, all those in favour of refusal, please show your hands digitally. Okay, that's five votes uh, in favour of refusal. And uh, uh, all those against, please remove your hands if you voted in favour of that one. And that's Councillor Fletcher and Rice, which which uh, makes sense given the uh, debates. Okay then, so Wendy, if you're happy with that, uh, that's Woodlands Square Farm, and that's recommendation for refusal. Is that confirmed? Does Councillor Salmons, which way does she vote? Because I didn't see her hand come up. Yeah, okay, so it was Sorry. five votes. I'm still, I'm still having um, sound issues. Yes, I'm against refusal. Okay. okay, thank you. So that was, uh, if I'm, if, is that five votes in favour of refusal and three votes against, Wendy? Yes, that's correct, Chair. Excellent. All right, then. So uh, with that, uh, application reference. Uh, Two one stroke zero zero one five stroke five six stroke FUL Woodlands Quay Farm has been refused. Okay, uh, thank you, members, and that takes us on to the last item on the agenda, which is uh, agenda item eleven twenty eight Ashley Gardens uh, Stiver Clays. Um, Ian, can I understand your question? Yeah, go ahead, Councillor. Um, I'm just wondering, um, I just noticed that we have um, a councillor speaking on this application and they're also up next and then we've got per. Would that be correct or is that okay that she still does that? Okay, yeah, thank you for the question there, Councillor Lawrence. Um, obviously, if everyone could turn off their mics, I'm getting a bit of, um, uh, uh, I'm getting a bit of echo there. Um, Councillor, sorry, uh, Lee Nicholson, would you like to come in there? So we've got an application here. Is this in Stipper Clays or Black Shorts? It says Stipper Clays, but is that in the Black Shorts board? Yes, Chair. Okay, all right then. Uh, Lee, obviously, um, that obviously a question's been raised there. Um, is it, does an, a declaration of interest need to be cited, or is it is it a case of because uh, Councillor um, Redsell was not a member of the planning committee? It's uh, it's, it's an old word. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, as my understanding of this is Councillor Redsell's um, exercising the right um, to, to speak as a ward member. Um, I'll probably defer to legal, um, but I do I do know that um, the the, the council's monitoring officer has reviewed. The items that we're heading to planning committee this evening because of, of PERDA. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm quite satisfied, but I would just like Caroline to come in if, if she wouldn't mind. Thank you. Uh, Caroline, are you uh, with us? Sorry, um, there was so much noise in the background, I, I didn't actually catch what the question was. Uh, Lee, did you want to? Uh... It, it's, it might even be one for Wendy, actually, because I did hear something about it was one of the members. Um, so, you, you, you know, you could, maybe something at the end. Uh, yeah, but... sorry, sorry, Caroline. Um, sorry, just to confirm, um, we've got a speaker this evening who's an elected councillor. That's Councillor Joy Redsell, and she's also uh, a member of the Black Shots Ward. Um, and she's uh, speaking, uh, I believe, against this particular item, but she's also up for election in May. Um, Councillor Lawrence was just um, confirming to make sure that uh, that is acceptable. And uh, Lee Nicholson just picked up on the point that all these applications were looked at by the monitoring officer, so he believes everything was OK. It just was really picking up your opinion. Right, OK, thank you for that. Um, right, I think... 
I, I, I mean, to be perfectly honest, this is this is something that I would have, um, that would, I just, I'm, I'm not quite sure. Um, as, as the military officer has uh, reviewed, um, I, I think we'll have to rely on, on, on that. Um, because as, as it involves elections, I'm sorry, it's not something that um, I feel that confident on, on, um, on advising on. I, I, um, I don't know, Wendy, if you've got any um, view on that. Okay, yeah, no, Wendy does have her hand up. So, Wendy, would you like to come uh, in there and just uh, clarify what you, what you perceive to be? Yes, Chair. So, Councillor Redsell, although she's up for election, that's right, um, she does still have her right to speak as a ward councillor. She is the existing ward councillor for this ward, and she's in, within her right to speak. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, all right then, uh, Lee, uh, sorry, you, did you put your hand down? Um, yeah, uh, Lee's put his hand down. Okay, so um, she does have a right to speak. I suppose, I mean, I don't know how it works out. I mean, ultimately, if, if we're looking at two applications here, some residents in favour, some against, I can see how, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know, I'd assume they're cancelling each other out because whilst you might be pleasing some, you're obviously upsetting others, but I'll, I'll, I'll have to look at, um, I'll have to look in that in further detail. Um, Lee, 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 have you just to carry on? Carry on? Thank you, Thank you um, uh, uh, Wendy when confirmed what I, I, I had in my mind, so yeah, I'm happy for, 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 for it to continue. So. Excellent, okay. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Councillor Lawrence, for uh, raising that. I was just concerned I saw that this is seen as bad publicity. No, no, I understand this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lawrence. Uh, Ian. Ian. Thank you. Hey, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, hello, Councillors. Um, if I could show, them, show, my, show my screen um, for this application for 28 Ashley Gardens. Yeah, um, yeah. Here, it's very um stilted. Sorry. Hey, Ian, did you uh, try work it work out your mic? See if there's anything to it. Um, Boris, is that a better? Um, no, no. Well, it's well, ever so slightly. Just try, try again. How about that? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I can, I can hear you just about. It's, it's whether the other, if any other members have any issues. Uh, is there any problems? No, go, go ahead. Sure, Anderson. continue. Thank you, Chairman. This is application for 28 Ashley Gardens. This um, application site is. Um, I've got, sorry, sorry, sorry to disturb you there. Uh, I've got a couple of hands being raised, um, which uh, means I assume that you can do. Uh, Councillor Lawrence, uh, Councillor Potter, I mean, Sam. Oh, yeah. Okay, all right then. No, no, it's okay. Um, I, I can't hear either. That's okay, that's okay. Ian, do you have um, any other, do you have speakers inside your, your remote device or um, just let me maybe, maybe try that? Just to give Ian a few moments there to um, Okay, uh, Ian, um, can you can you hear us? How are you how are you getting on? Uh, Lee, can you can you uh, make contact with uh, Ian? See how he's getting on. 
Yes, thanks, Chair. We're just um, we're, we're just trying to sort this out um, on our side. But I think what we might um, do, uh, Jonathan, I think, has offered to present the item. Um, if not, so two seconds. Sort this out. Uh, that sounds fine. Uh, if we just give uh, 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 Ian a few more moments. If not, we'll give uh, we'll, we'll, we'll hand over to John. Thank you. Chair, did you want to adjourn the meeting for a few minutes while Ian sorts his mic out? Um, well, actually, it depends. I mean, if John's happy to pick up uh, on the report, um, it, it may be that we can, um, maybe we should just carry on. I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd grab confirmation from Lee Nicholson on that. But um, uh, Lee, what, what, what's your thought? Should we adjourn or should we actually allow John to take over? Sorry, Chair. If we could just wait just two, two, two seconds. We're just, we're just waiting for a response from the officers, and then we'll, um, we'll hopefully pick up. But, but worst case, we, we might just need to adjourn for two minutes. Um, but just hold fire a second. Sorry, I can, I can, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Um, I can hear you. Um, it sounds very similar to before. I was really just doing if other members still having trouble. So, um, you give it another shot, yeah. and then we'll see if there's any other concerns. See my screen. Yeah, I can see the screen. Um, members, if you've got any problems here, and just raise your hand. Um, so the application is relates to a, a single story dwelling. Um, so yeah, Ian, sorry, sorry to stop you. There. I've got a few more hands raised. So <laughs> um, I tell you what, as when you was away, I think Jonathan King kindly um, uh, said that he would be able to present the report on your behalf. Um, as I said, I can hear you, but obviously if other members can't, then um, that's, uh, we're just going to have to move on to John, I think. I do apologise uh, for that. Uh, um, Lee, um, is John OK to yeah. take this one? Yeah, I'm ready. Ian can just put the presentation up and then I'll run through the slides. Excellent. Ian, if you'd be so kind as to put that presentation up. Excellent. Thank you. We can see that. OK. So members can see the site in front of the now number 26 Ashley Gardens um, the one with the red red dot on it it's, so it's a detached property there's a pair of semi-detached properties to the left 13 and 32 and semi-detached property is to the right 24 and 26 you have the next slide please so that's the exist there we go so that's the existing site plan on the left the proposed site plan on the right so the existing property has a detached garage at the back with a driveway to the right on the side. Um, the proposed layout would have a single storey side extension to the right where the existing access is to the garage. Next slide, please. So that's the existing property. You can see the garage at the back, um, no front dormers and a very small single storey rear extension. Next slide, please. So the proposal before you is for a single storey side extension to the right hand side and a pair of pitch roof dormers and a roof light in the front elevation. You can see a staircase so there'll be habitable room in the loft space. Um, there's also proposed, next slide please. Oh, so those are, the, those are some pictures of the property at the moment. So that's the front of the house. Next photo. That's the existing from the, the right hand side. So there's um, off road parking to the front. And you can see a dormer on the property to the left. Next photo, please. That's the relationship between the property at number 28, um, which has side facing dormers. Next photo, please. And um, that's looking down the street. So there's a property with similar front dormers on, on that property. There's other front dormers on semi-detached properties down the road. Um, there's other properties in the street with roof lights. So the application is for the, the two front dormers, changes to the access and parking arrangements and um, a single story side extension. 
officers have found that the proposal is acceptable in design terms, both in relation to the front dormers and the side extension. And there isn't considered to be any impact on neighbour amenity as a result of either of those extensions, which would be harmful. So the application is recommended for approval. Thank you. Okay, then, thank you. Um, do we have, uh, uh, would anyone like to open up the questioning? No, okay, uh, just the one very brief question there, John. So what the uh, applicants applying for here is generally, um, uh, it's generally what's, I can see there's quite a lot of extensions taking place in that in that road, including the neighbours. So it's pretty pretty common sort of type of style of extension, yeah. Yeah, the side extension is fairly similar to others in the area, and it's a fairly common feature on these type of properties. Um, and equally, the two front dormers they're similar in design and scale to some of those you've seen on other properties nearby. It's a detached property as well, so there's no not considered to be any concerns in terms of the, the visual appearance of either of those elements. Okay, then I'm looking at uh, so we're looking at the front dormers, unlikely to negatively impact the amenities of neighbouring properties. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. They look towards the private, the public side of the street, so there wouldn't be any um, harmful overlooking, and the dormers themselves are fairly small, so there would be marginal impact in terms of the the mass and the bulk of those dormers okay and uh, i'm looking at uh, some of the comments so they're saying access to site um guttering and drainage pipes should not overhang the boundary uh significant loss of light um what how we're we looking there so because guttering wouldn't that wouldn't overhang the boundary would it or, or what what would how would you how would you solve that problem um, the, the planning consent wouldn't be concerned in terms of boundary issues. We can't get involved in those those issues. The plans do show a flat roof um, for the single storey extension with a sort of parapet roof. So it doesn't look, look as though there would need to be any guttering on the, the single storey element. So I can't see that should be an issue for those the neighbours on that side, no. Okay, then fine. And uh, we've got a concern here, significant loss of light. Um, has, has that been looked into? Yeah, um, the, the application is well, it's for a single story extension, so there would be limited impact because the existing property is already is higher than the extension. So the property to the right, as you would look at it from the road, would would have um, shadowing impacts from the existing property and single story extension of these sort are common on on shared boundaries such as this. And the, the two front dormer windows, they're so far forward of the sort of habitable rooms of the other properties on either side, that they have, li have limited impact on those occupiers as a result of the size of the dormers as well. So it's considered that there would be limited harm to either the neighbouring occupiers. Okay, then. Okay, that's absolutely fine. All right, then. So uh, I've got no further questions there. Um, I can't see anyone else's hands raised. Uh, so with that, uh, we'll go to Wendy. Wendy, I understand we have some uh, speaker statements. Yes, Chair. The first speaker statement is from Mrs. Lorraine Mead. So, Mrs. Mead, if you'd like to come in and present your statement. Yes, good evening. Um, shall I begin? Uh, yes, please. Thank yes. you. Okay. Um, our property has a side access and windows which look out onto the flank wall of the neighbouring bungalow along with a side dormer constructed in 1998. We've had a right to light in our dormer for the last 22 years and would like this to continue. We believe the result of the permitted development and the dormer to the rear will have a detrimental effect on the light into our ground floor and first floor rooms. North facing rooms are not taken into consideration when applying the 45 and 60 degree angle rule, where particular property layouts are concerned, such as ours. We've attached a photo of the view from the bedroom in the side dormer towards the back that will also look out onto the cheeks of the rear dormer. Regarding the current application, the proposed dormer at the front will only add to this loss of light down to the side of our property. The bedroom window would look out outward onto its cheeks, blocking light and causing an oppressive outlook. We understand you have sight of the objections and have attached photos showing the current outlook. 
We understand that no site visits were made and Google Street Maps were used to make an important decision that would have a detrimental effect on our property. It fails to give the correct depth and feel of space. The planning application has had many and various changes as detailed online. Even the Iways department failed to grasp the planning application and thought my neighbours were changing their garage to a residential use. This email was redacted from the website on the 19th of February. We hope that you can take into consideration all the objections we have raised with the issue of light that has been the major concern in respect of the various planning applications submitted by our neighbours. Following the uploaded agenda for this evening's committee meeting, I have the following further comments to add. The proposal is incorrect regarding an email of the 30th of March. The plan numbers should read 205A if connected to the 9th of February 2021 entry. Publicity 4.2. We also raised discrepancies with the Thurrock Council Planning Department's delegated report. This is not mentioned in the comments raised within this document. Design 6.11. The numbers 15, 18, 21 and 24 are all bungalows next to bungalows. There are only two identical examples of a particular detached bungalow next to a semi-detached house. That is 28 next to 30. 27 next to 29 that are immediately opposite therefore there is no example neighbor amenity 6.14 thorough council planning department states our dormer faces north in fact we we face south to the applicant site 6.15 uh, we are not totally blocked by the gable end wall but an addition of a front dormer will block the window causing diminished light as shown in the photo uploaded to Jenny Shade, Matthew Bolter and members of the committee. Our Thorot Council Planning Department have also uploaded an incorrect map dealing, detailing 12 Lowman Park Ockenden printed the 12th of April within this document instead of 30 Ashley Gardens. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak this evening. Okay, thank you. And uh, Wendy, would you like to go to the next uh, statement? Yes, that's Councillor Redsdale. Okay, yeah, Councillor Redsdale, when you're ready, please uh, proceed. Thank you, Chair. Um, just like to put um, what you said before, it isn't a Stifford Clays, it's Little Thurrock Black Shots. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you. I would like to speak on the um, in planning application 21 stroke 00205 stroke HHA. Um, this has been an application fraught by so many applications and no site visits made to the neighbouring property to see what the effect would be. The impact this will have on the neighbouring property is extensive. The loss of light to the side of the neighbouring property is going to affect them greatly. There have been many discrepancies from the agent also. As Mrs Mead has reiterated uh, in her um, speech she has just given you, visits were not made to her property and only Google Maps were used. There have also been too many changes made in different offices and many dates changed and has, none, has gone on too long. I would like to ask that a site visit be made and I know you've mentioned in the previous that you're not doing site visits at the moment but the photos may help you so that the committee can see for themselves what effect this will have on the property. They look out onto a wall now. This application will make the situation worse. There will be no light at all. This is also out of context with the street scene. Sometimes loss of light in an application seems to have very small part to play. But when it comes out, when the light from your window, then it does have a great effect and should not be taken lightly. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you very much, Councillor Redsell. And um, uh, Wendy, uh, any further statements? Yes, Chair, we've got one more statement, and that's from the applicant, um, Mr Anthony Tobin, who has asked me to read this out on their behalf. So I'm writing to you as owners of 28 Ashley Gardens. We have been living at the address since 16th October 2020 and bought the bungalow as our forever home. Having considered moving out of the area in which we have both lived in all of our lives, 
we decided on buying 28 Ashley Gardens and staying in Thurrock. The reasons for this were the potential we saw in it, the friendly neighbourhood. We have a friend and work colleague who live down the road and the locality to our children's secondary school, William Edwards. This especially is important to us as it allows our children to independently commute to school on foot or by bicycle. This eliminates the need to travel by car and is convenient as we work full time as a mechanical engineer and primary school cover supervisor. Having seen other renovated bungalows in the road, we see this as a great and one of opportunity for us to build a family home with some personal touches and to give us the room we, we require. A ready made slash refurbished house in Thurrock would exceed our budget. We plan to optimise the energy efficiency of our property and use sustainable, environmentally friendly products and the highest energy efficient rated appliances available to us. As a family, we are conscious of our carbon footprint and aim to reduce it wherever possible. We feel that our planning application is by no means unreasonable and that our experienced architect has designed the development within the guidelines set up by the MPPF. Unfortunately for us, we have had to scale back our original plans for the rear extended lot projection. Included in the original plans were two front dormers, which were deemed acceptable by the planning officer in their officer's report. We feel that we have been reasonable in our redesign, which seeks approval for the two front dormers in this resubmitted scheme without the previously proposed rear extension. The front dormers will be in keeping with the other converted bungalows in Ashley Gardens that have them and they are set back from the side elevation so these would not cause a detrimental impact to the neighbouring properties. All we desire to do is to create a lovely family home in which we plan on living in for many many years. This is not just another development project to sell on. We would like to renovate our property, property to maximise the space for our family with the guidelines set out. We do not in any circumstance wish to cause any disruption or upset to our neighbours. Furthermore, the removal of the chimney stack would potentially reduce high level shadow to the neighbours windows. This application is only for the front dormers and the side extension. There should be no reference to the rear dormer. dormer. Many thanks for your time in reading our justification of our application. Okay, thank you, Wendy. All right then, so uh, members, uh, are there any further, oh, I've got any hands shown here? Uh, let's have a look. We have, let's go Councillor Fletcher and Councillor Fossil. Thanks, Chair. Um, to be quite honest, I'm not sure whether we're in a position to even look at this application. I'm, I'm slightly concerned, actually, no, not slightly, I'm very concerned by the apparent number of discrepancies that uh, the neighbour has brought up, uh, Mrs Lohman has brought up, uh, around um, differences between the application, the picture we're painted in the application and what she actually sees in real life. Um, I mean, yes, it, 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 it does sound a bit strange that no uh, site visits were apparently made, but I think beyond that, there seem to, have been, there seem to be so many discrepancies, different dates, um, we're apparently not even entirely sure where the place is, that I'm wondering if we are being given a clear and accurate enough picture to even make a decision on. It worries me. OK, thank you, Councillor Fletcher. Uh, Councillor Potter. Yeah, yeah, thank you, yeah, Chair. Thank you, Chair. I, uh, I, uh, I listen carefully. Care. Has someone, someone got their got mic their on? Councillor Fletcher. Is that yourself, sir? Yeah, there oh. you go. Mine's off, Mine's guys. Off, guys. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, OK, thank you. Um, can you hear me OK? Yes, I can. Thank you. I can. All right. Yeah, I listened very carefully to the uh, speaker statements by Mrs Mead and Councillor Redsill, and they both uh, mentioned to, to quite, you know, that there was no site visit uh, prior to this. I, I, I've never recommended a site visit and all the time I've been on committee but I think in this case a site visit would be the way forward and I would like to recommend that thank you okay thank you um yeah so we just we, we are in question still but obviously that has been noted and we can uh, we can explore that when we get to a debate councillor rice uh yes chair my mine is a debate item so I'll withdraw until the questions are finished OK, thank you. Right, I'll bring in Councillor Schnick. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
just looking at these plans, it seems like there's a gap still going to exist between the properties either side, isn't there? I don't know how wide that gap is. It looks like there's driveways either side. I don't know if you could answer. Yeah, no, what we'll do, uh, Councillor Chin, is to bring in uh, John. Um, John, before I bring you in, obviously there's quite a lot of concern being raised there at the way that this has been handled, the way this has been looked into. Um, obviously, there's quite a lot of criticism over the loss of light. Could you just clarify things from your end and, and what your thoughts are? Have you, have you double checked everything to make sure there's not an impact that, that has been perceived? So, thoughts? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Yeah, there's been a, a few points, as you said, that have been raised through the, the questions and the discussion. Um, sort of like to clarify at the outset, there was a site visit that took place for this application. Um, members will have seen the pictures on the screen on the presentation itself. Um, the case officer for the current application has visited the site and she took pictures of the site. She's looked down Blackshot's Lane and looked at other similar properties in the area, um, which she included those pictures of other properties with similar dormers. Um, at that site visit, she would have looked at the relationship between this property and Mr. Mr. and Mrs. Mead's property to the to the left as you look at it, and the other property to the right. So um, I'm more than happy that a site visit has taken place for this application, and it has been considered correctly. Um, would pick up a couple of the points that have been raised by members. Yep, there is a small error in the report where it says the um, dormer is on the north facing elevation. It's correct, Mrs Mead is correct. It's on the south facing elevation of her property looking towards the application site. Um, and there has been a corrected site plan sent round um, for the Ashley Gardens, for the Ashley, for, sorry, for the um, property itself rather than the site plan that's on the um, the, uh, the uh, sorry, that's on the agenda itself. So I'm satisfied that the, there aren't errors that are likely to cause a problem. In terms of Councillor Shinnick's point, there would be space to either side of the property. Um, the properties at 28 and 24 do, sorry, at 20, sorry, at 26 and 30 do have driveways on each side. So there would be space to either side of the property that would be that would be within the boundaries of other properties, but there is still space on either side at this point. Um, I think a, a number of concerns have been raised about what is felt to be concerns with the process. Um, there aren't any concerns with the process as far as I can tell. I've looked through the applications and the history. Um, there have been three previous applications, so there was an earlier a reference application for larger rear extension that is something that can be built without under permitted development without planning permission being required there was a subsequent householder application the 24-01456 hha which was an application that was refused because there were concerns about the impact and size and design of the rear um, rear dormer window and then there was a subsequent subsequent application for single story rear and side extension and loft conversion with a rear dormer and three front roof lights and that was a certificate of lawfulness so that is work that could be carried out without planning permission being required and in terms of the impact of those developments the lawful development certificate and the prior approval application result in a development that is bigger than that is that which is proposed under the current application so the current application is just for the two front dormer windows and the side extension and the works to the driveway. We can't consider any of the previous works that have been given a lawful development certificate under where the development is prior approval or permitted development. So we can't consider the harm that could arise from those. So we can only consider the front dormers and the single storey side extension. Um, and in terms of that, officers are happy that those, those developments are fine. Okay, thank you. Um, and the impact from the dormers uh, with the removal of the chimney stack, what we're saying, that's, um, that's minimal. Minimal, yeah. Okay, all right then, fine. Right, um, let's have a look. Uh, Councillor Fletcher. 
Thanks, Chair. Maybe you want to take offline, uh, John, but I would suggest that if there appear to be discrepancies in terms of distances, heights, and even where the place is, then there has been a problem with the process. I don't think it's worth just uh, uh, shrugging that one off. There clearly is something that didn't work like that. OK, then. All right, then. So um, there are no further questions. Uh, that now opens us up to debate. Um, there obviously was the motion from Councillor Potter over a site of visit. Uh, Councillor Rice, you get your hand raised if you just wanted to add anything. Um, I was just going to say I was going to agree with the officer's recommendations because uh, it seems a very straightforward application. Um, there has been a site visit, as Jonathan has alluded to, and um, you know we should go ahead with it, Chair. OK, thank you. Um, I can't see any other hands raised. Uh, let's go to Councillor Potter. You have recommended a site visit. Um, obviously, just to be aware that if, if we did go to that site visit, retiring members would not be able to participate because um, obviously the next meeting is in June um, and we're not even doing site visits at the moment anyway. But just to make you aware of that. Uh, as, oh, as can, I, to, can I... Yep. Oh, can I can I can I say something in regard to that? Yeah, um, the only reason I, I raised the recommendation for a site visit was because I was told by the previous speakers there hadn't been one. So, if it is the case there has been site visit by council officers, I withdraw um, my recommendation. No, well played. Okay then. Okay. All right then. So um, let's have a look here. There's no other hands raised. Um, Obviously, having, having looked in the report in detail, I think ultimately when you're looking at these types of developments, there's, there's always going to be um, something that the neighbours are not going to be happy with. Clearly, yeah. the, the points that they have raised um, are important. My own personal opinion is that I don't think there's enough there, not when you look at um, the extensions that have taken place in the road. Um, I, I just don't think there's enough to, to, to go away from the officer's uh, recommendation. Did anyone else have anything to add before we, we head to the vote? Um, no. no, okay, no hands are raised. So there is a recommendation set out in the report. That's uh, recommendation 8.0 found on page 118. And that's to recommend, uh, recommend uh, approve, approval. Um, I'll, uh, I'll recommend that. Is that seconded, that's seconded by yourself, Councillor Rice? Yes, uh, yes. We'll head to the vote there. Could you show me your hands digitally if you are in favour of recommendation approval? Oh, mine as well. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so that's seven in favour. Um, all those uh, against, please show your hand and lower your hand if you voted. And uh, I can see Councillor Fletcher. Councillor Rice, can you lower your hand, please? Uh, Councillor Fletcher, you're against. So that makes the vote seven in favour of one against. Uh, Wendy, uh, did you get that? Uh, Wendy, you're happy? Yeah, you're happy with that vote. OK, so application. One, sorry, there's one councillor that hasn't raised their hand. I've got eight votes here. I think Councillor Burns not here, is he? Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, that's okay. Um, all right then. So, application reference uh, twenty one stroke zero zero two oh five stroke HHA twenty eight Ashley Gardens uh, has been approved. Okay, then members, that uh, concludes the meeting. Um, thank you everyone for for your attendance this evening. And as I as I started at the, at the beginning of the evening, thank you for the last twelve months. It's been incredibly enjoyable. We will obviously be in communication over the next few days via email based on uh, our conversations at the beginning. And uh, again, just a quick thank you to Steve Taylor for your time and effort this year as well as a co-opted member. All right then, thank you everyone and a good evening. And uh, yeah, we'll be in contact. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Happy St. George's Day.